AI Read to Me presents Christmas Stories by Louisa May Alcott. Now close your eyes and relax. Excerpt from Little Women Playing Pilgrims Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things, and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got father and mother and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner. The four young faces on which the firelight shone, brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again, as Joe said sadly, We haven't got father, and shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say perhaps never, but each silently added it, thinking of father far away where the fighting was. Nobody spoke for a minute. Then Meg said in a, an altered tone, You know the reason Mother proposed not having any presents this Christmas was, because it is going to be a hard winter for everyone. And she thinks we ought not to spend money for pleasure when our men are suffering so in the army. We can't do much, but we can make our little sacrifices and ought to do it gladly. But I'm afraid I don't. And Meg shook her head as she thought regretfully of all the pretty things she wanted. But I don't think the little we should spend would do any good. We've each got a dollar, and the army wouldn't be much helped by our giving that. I agree not to expect anything from Mother or you, but I do want to buy Undine and Sintrin for myself. I've wanted it so long, said Joe, who was a bookworm. I planned to spend mine in new music, said Beth, with a little sigh, which no one heard but the hearth brush and kettle holder. I shall get a nice box of Faber's drawing pencils. I really need them, said Amy decidedly. Mother didn't say anything about our money and she won't wish us to give up everything. Let's each buy what we want and have a little fun. I'm sure we work hard enough to earn it, cried Joe, examining the heels of her shoes in a gentlemanly manner. I know I do. Teaching those tiresome children nearly all day when I'm longing to enjoy myself at home, began Meg in the complaining tone again. You don't have half such a hard time as I do, said Joe. How would you like to be shut up for hours with a nervous, fussy old lady who keeps you trotting, is never satisfied, and worries you till you're ready to fly out the window or cry? It's naughty to fret, but I do think washing dishes and keeping things tidy is the worst work in the world. It makes me cross, and my hands get so stiff. I can't practice well at all. And Beth looked at her rough hands with a sigh that anyone could hear that time. I don't believe any of you suffer as I do, cried Amy, for you don't have to go to school with impertinent girls who plague you if you don't know your lessons, and laugh at your dresses, and label your father if he isn't rich, and insult you when your nose isn't nice. If you mean libel, I'd say so, and not talk about labels, as if Papa was a pickle bottle, advised Joe, laughing. I know what I mean, and you needn't be satirical about it. It's proper to use good words, 
and improve your vocabulary, returned Amy with dignity. Don't peck at one another, children. Don't you wish we had the money Papa lost when we were little, Joe? Dear me, how happy and good we'd be if we had no worries, said Meg, who could remember better times. You said the other day, you thought we were a deal happier than the King children, for they were fighting and fretting all the time, in spite of their money. So I did, Beth. Well, I think we are. For though we do have to work, we make fun of ourselves, and are a pretty jolly set, as Joe would say. Joe does use such slang words, observed Amy with a reproving look at the long figure stretched on the rug. Joe immediately sat up, put her hands in her pockets, and began to whistle. Don't, Joe. It's so boyish. That's why I do it. I detest rude, unladylike girls. I hate affected, nimini-pimini chits. Birds in their little nests agree, sang Beth, the peacemaker, with such a funny face that both sharp voices softened to a laugh, and the pecking ended for that time. Really, girls, you are both to be blamed, said Meg, beginning to lecture in her elder sisterly fashion. You are old enough to leave off boyish tricks and to behave better. Josephine. It didn't matter so much when you were a little girl, but now you are so tall and turn up your hair. You should remember that you are a young lady. I'm not, and if turning up my hair makes me one, I'll wear it in two tails till I'm twenty, cried Jo, pulling off her net and shaking down a chestnut mane. I hate to think I've got to grow up and be Miss March and wear long gowns and look as prim as a china aster. It's bad enough to be a girl anyway when I like boys' games and work and manners. I can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy. And it's worse than ever now, for I'm dying to go and fight with Papa and I can only stay home and knit, like a pokey old woman. And Joe shook the blue army sock till the needles rattled like castanets, and her ball bounded across the room. Poor Joe. It's too bad, but it can't be helped. So you must try to be contented with making your name boyish and playing brother to us girls said Beth, stroking the rough head with a hand that all the dish washing and dusting in the world could not make ungentle in its touch. As for you, Amy, continued Meg, you are altogether too particular and prim. Your airs are funny now, but you'll grow up an affected little goose if you don't take care. I like your nice manners and refined ways of speaking when you don't try to be elegant. But your absurd words are as bad as Joe's slang. If Joe is a tomboy and Amy a goose, what am I, please? asked Beth, ready to share the lecture. You're a dear and nothing else, answered Meg warmly, and no one contradicted her for the mouse was the pet of the family. As young readers like to know how people look, we will take this moment to give them a little sketch of the four sisters, who sat knitting away in the twilight, while the December snow fell quietly without, and the fire crackled cheerfully within. It was a comfortable room, though the carpet was faded, and the furniture very plain, for a good picture or two hung on the walls, 
books filled the recesses. Chrysanthemums and Christmas roses bloomed in the windows, and a pleasant atmosphere of home peace pervaded it. Margaret, the eldest of the four, was sixteen, and very pretty, being plump and fair, with large eyes, plenty of soft brown hair, a sweet mouth, and white hands, of which she was rather vain. Fifteen-year-old Joe was very tall, thin, and brown, and reminded one of a colt, for she never seemed to know what to do with her long limbs, which were very much in her way. She had a decided mouth, a comical nose, and sharp, gray eyes, which appeared to see everything, and were by turns fierce, funny, or thoughtful. Her long, thick hair was her one beauty, but it was usually bundled into a net to be out of her way. Round shoulders had Joe, big hands and feet, a flyaway look to her clothes, and the uncomfortable appearance of a girl who was rapidly shooting up into a woman and didn't like it. Elizabeth, or Beth, as everyone called her, was a rosy, smooth-haired, bright-eyed girl of thirteen, with a shy manner, a timid voice, and a peaceful expression, which was seldom disturbed. Her father called her Little Miss Tranquility, and the name suited her excellently, for she seemed to live in a happy world of her own, only venturing out to meet the few whom she trusted and loved. Amy, though the youngest, was a most important person, in her own opinion at least. A regular snow maiden, with blue eyes and yellow hair curling on her shoulders, pale and slender, and always carrying herself like a young lady, mindful of her manners. What the characters of the four sisters were we will leave to be found out. The clock struck six, and having swept up the hearth, Beth put a pair of slippers down to warm. Somehow, the sight of the old shoes had a good effect upon the girls, for mother was coming, and everyone brightened to welcome her. Meg stopped lecturing and lighted the lamp. Amy got out of the easy chair without being asked, and Joe forgot how tired she was as she sat up to hold the slippers nearer to the blaze. They are quite worn out. Marmy must have a new pair. I thought I'd get her some with my dollar, said Beth. No, I shall, cried Amy. I'm the oldest, began Meg, but Joe cut in with the decided, I'm the man of the family now Papa is away, and I shall provide the slippers, for he told me to take special care of Mother while he was gone. I'll tell you what we'll do, said Beth. Let's each get her something for Christmas, and not get anything for ourselves. That's like you, dear. What will we get? exclaimed Joe. Everyone thought soberly for a minute, then Meg announced, as if the idea was suggested by the sight of her own pretty hands. I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. Army shoes, best to be had, cried Joe. Some handkerchiefs, all hemmed, said Beth. I'll get a little bottle of cologne. She likes it, and it won't cost much so I'll have some left to buy my pencils, added Amy. How will we give the things? asked Meg. Put them on the table, and bring her in, and see her open the bundles. Don't you remember how we used to do on our birthdays? answered Joe. I used to be so frightened when it was my turn to sit in the chair with the crown on, and see you all come marching round to give the presents with a kiss. 
I liked the things and the kisses, but it was dreadful to have you sit looking at me while I opened the bundles, said Beth, who was toasting her face and the bread for tea at the same time. Let Marmy think we are getting things for ourselves, and then surprise her. We must go shopping tomorrow afternoon, Meg. There is so much to do about the play for Christmas night, said Joe, marching up and down with her hands behind her back and her nose in the air. I don't mean to act any more after this time. I'm getting too old for such things, observed Meg, who was as much a child as ever about dressing up frolics. You won't stop, I know as long as you can trail round in a white gown with your hair down and wear gold paper jewelry. You're the best actress we've got, and there'll be an end of everything if you quit the boards, said Joe. We ought to rehearse tonight. Come here, Amy, and do the fainting scene, for you are as stiff as a poker in that. I can't help it. I never saw anyone faint and I don't choose to make myself all black and blue, tumbling flat as you do. If I can go down easily, I'll drop. If I can't, I shall fall into a chair and be graceful. I don't care if Hugo does come at me with a pistol, returned Amy, who was not gifted with dramatic power, but was chosen because she was small enough to be borne out, shrieking by the villain of the piece. Do it this way. Clasp your hands so, and stagger across the room, crying frantically, Roderigo. Save me. Save me. And away went Joe, with a melodramatic scream, which was truly thrilling. Amy followed but she poked her hands out stiffly before her and jerked herself along as if she went by machinery, and her ow was more suggestive of pins being run into her than of fear and anguish. Joe gave a despairing groan, and Meg laughed outright, while Beth let her bread burn as she watched the fun with interest. It's no use. Do the best you can when the time comes, and if the audience laughs, don't blame me. Come on, Meg. Then things went smoothly, for Don Pedro defied the world in a speech of two pages without a single break. Hagar, the witch, chanted an awful incantation over her kettle full of simmering toads, with weird effect. Roderigo rent his chains asunder manfully, and Hugo died in agonies of remorse and arsenic, with a wild, ha, ha. It's the best we've had yet, said Meg, as the dead villain sat up and rubbed his elbows. I don't see how you can write and act such splendid things, Joe. You're a regular Shakespeare, exclaimed Beth, who firmly believed that her sisters were gifted with wonderful genius in all things. Not quite, replied Joe modestly. I do think the witch's curse, an operatic tragedy, is rather a nice thing, but I'd like to try Macbeth if we only had a trapdoor for Banquo. I always wanted to do the killing part. Is that a dagger that I see before me? muttered Joe, rolling her eyes and clutching at the air, as she had seen a famous tragedian do. No, it's the toasting fork, with mother's shoe on it, instead of the bread. Beth's stage struck, cried Meg and the rehearsal ended in a general burst of laughter. Glad to find you so merry, my girls, said a cheery voice at the door, and actors and audience turned to welcome a tall, 
motherly lady with a can I help you look about her, which was truly delightful. She was not elegantly dressed, but a noble looking woman, and the girls thought the gray cloak and unfashionable bonnet covered the most splendid mother in the world. Well, dearies, how have you got on today? There was so much to do getting the boxes ready to go tomorrow that I didn't come home to dinner. Has anyone called Beth? How is your cold, Meg? Joe, you look tired to death. Come and kiss me, baby. While making these maternal inquiries, Mrs. March got her wet things off, her warm slippers on, and sitting down in the easy chair, drew Amy to her lap, preparing to enjoy the happiest hour of her busy day. The girls flew about, trying to make things comfortable, each in her own way. Meg arranged the tea table. Joe brought wood and set chairs, dropping, overturning, and clattering everything she touched. Beth trotted to and fro between parlor kitchen, quiet and busy, while Amy gave directions to everyone as she sat with her hands folded. As they gathered about the table, Mrs. March said, with a particularly happy face, I've got a treat for you after supper. A quick, bright smile went round like a streak of sunshine. Beth clapped her hands, regardless of the biscuit she held, and Joe tossed up her napkin, crying, A letter. A letter. Three cheers for father. Yes, a nice long letter. He is well, and thinks he shall get through the cold season better than we feared. He sends all sorts of loving wishes for Christmas, and an especial message to you girls, said Mrs. March, patting her pocket as if she had got a treasure there. Hurry and get done. Don't stop to quirk your little finger and simper over your plate, Amy, cried Joe, choking on her tea and dropping her bread, butter side down, on the carpet in her haste to get at the treat. Beth ate no more, but crept away to sit in her shadowy corner and brood over the delight to come, till the others were ready. I think it was so splendid in father to go as chaplain when he was too old to be drafted and not strong enough for a soldier, said Meg warmly. Don't I wish I could go as a drummer of even, what's its name, or a nurse, so I could be near him and help him, exclaimed Joe with a groan. It must be very disagreeable to sleep in a tent and eat all sorts of bad-tasting things, and drink out of a tin mug, sighed Amy. When will he come home, Marmy? asked Beth, with a little quiver in her voice. Not for many months, dear, unless he is sick. He will stay and do his work faithfully as long as he can, and we won't ask for him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. Now come and hear the letter. They all drew to the fire, mother in the big chair with Beth at her feet. Meg and Amy perched on either arm of the chair, and Joe leaning on the back, where no one would see any sign of emotion if the letter should happen to be touching. Very few letters were written in those hard times that were not touching, especially those which fathers sent home. In this one little was said of the hardships endured, the dangers faced, or the homesickness conquered. 
It was a cheerful, hopeful letter, full of lively descriptions of camp life, marches, and military news. And only at the end did the writer's heart overflow with fatherly love and longing for the little girls at home. Give them all of my dear love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them by day. Pray for them by night, and find my best comfort in their affection at all times. A year seems very long to wait before I see them, but remind them that while we wait, we may all work, so that these hard days need not be wasted. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children to you, will do their duty faithfully, fight their bosom enemies bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them, I may be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. Everybody sniffed when they came to that part. Joe wasn't ashamed of the great tear that dropped off the end of her nose and Amy never minded the rumpling of her curls as she hid her face on her mother's shoulder and sobbed out, I am a selfish girl, but I'll truly try to be better, so he mayn't be disappointed in me by and by. We all will, cried Meg. I think too much of my looks and hate to work, but won't any more if I can help it. I'll try and be what he loves to call me, a little woman, and not be rough and wild, but do my duty here instead of wanting to be somewhere else, said Joe, thinking that keeping her temper at home was a much harder task than facing a rebel or two down south. Beth said nothing but wiped away her tears with the blue army sock and began to knit with all her might, losing no time in doing the duty that lay nearest her, while she resolved in her quiet little soul to be all that father hoped to find her when the year brought round the happy coming home. Mrs. March broke the silence that followed Joe's words by saying in her cheery voice, do you remember how you used to play Pilgrim's Progress when you were little things? Nothing delighted you more than to have me tie my peace bags on your backs for burdens, give you hats and sticks and rolls of paper, and let you travel through the house from the cellar, which was the city of destruction, up, up to the housetop where you had all the lovely things you could collect to make a celestial city. What fun it was, especially going by the lions, fighting Apollyon, and passing through the valley where the hobgoblins were, said Joe. I liked the place where the bundles fell off and tumbled downstairs, said Meg. I don't remember much about it, except that I was afraid of the cellar, and the dark entry, and always liked the cake and milk we had up at the top. If I wasn't too old for such things, I'd rather like to play it over again, said Amy, who began to talk of renouncing childish things at the mature age of twelve. We never are too old for this, my dear, because it is a play we are playing all the time in one way or another. Our burdens are here, our road is before us, and the longing for goodness and happiness is the guide that leads us through many troubles and mistakes to the peace which is a true celestial city. Now, my little pilgrims, suppose you begin again, not in play, but in earnest, and see how far on you can get before father comes home. Really, mother? 
Where are our bundles? asked Amy, who was a very literal young lady. Each of you told what your burden was just now, except Beth. I rather think she hasn't got any, said her mother. Yes, I have. Mine is dishes and dusters, and envying girls with nice pianos, and being afraid of people. Beth's bundle was such a funny one that everybody wanted to laugh, but nobody did, for it would have hurt her feelings very much. Let us do it, said Meg thoughtfully. It is only another name for trying to be good, and the story may help us. For though we do want to be good, it's hard work, and we forget, and don't do our best. We were in the slow of despond tonight, and Mother came and pulled us out, as help did in the book. We ought to have our role of directions, like Christian. What shall we do about that? asked Joe, delighted with the fancy which lent a little romance to the very dull task of doing her duty. Look under your pillows Christmas morning, and you will find your guidebook, replied Mrs. March. They talked over the new plan while old Hannah cleared the table. Then out came the four little work baskets, and the needles flew as the girls made sheets for Aunt March. It was uninteresting sewing, but tonight no one grumbled. They adopted Joe's plan of dividing the long seams into four parts and calling the quarters Europe, Asia, Africa, and America, and in that way got on capitally, especially when they talked about the different countries as they stitched their way through them. Especially when they talked about the different countries as they stitched their way through them. At nine, they stopped work and sang, as usual, before they went to bed. No one but Beth could get much music out of the old piano, but she had a way of softly touching the yellow keys and making a pleasant accompaniment to the simple songs they sang. Meg had a voice like a flute, and she and her mother led the little choir. Amy chirped like a cricket, and Joe wandered through the airs at her own sweet will, always coming out at the wrong place with a croak or a quaver that spoiled the most pensive tune. They had always done this from the time they could lisp. Crinkle, crinkle, little tar. And it had become a household custom. For the mother was a born singer. The first sound in the morning was her voice as she went about the house singing like a lark. And the last sound at night was the same cheery sound. For the girls never grew too old for that familiar lullaby. A Merry Christmas Joe was the first to wake in the gray dawn of Christmas morning. No stockings hung at the fireplace, and for a moment she felt as much disappointed as she did long ago, when her little sock fell down because it was crammed so full of goodies. Then she remembered her mother's promise, and slipping her hand under her pillow, drew out a little crimson-covered book. She knew it very well, for it was that beautiful old story of the best life ever lived. And Joe felt that it was a true guidebook for any pilgrim going on a long journey. She woke Meg with a Merry Christmas and bade her see what was under her pillow. A green-covered book appeared with the same picture inside, 
and a few words written by their mother, which made their one present very precious in their eyes. Presently, Beth and Amy woke to rummage and find their little books also, one dove-colored, the other blue, and all sat looking at and talking about them, while the east grew rosy with the coming day. In spite of her small vanities, Margaret had a sweet and pious nature, which unconsciously influenced her sisters, especially Jo, who loved her very tenderly, and obeyed her because her advice was so gently given. Girls, said Meg seriously, looking from the tumbled head beside her to the two little night-capped ones in the room beyond. Mother wants us to read and love and mind these books, and we must begin at once. We used to be faithful about it, but since Father went away and all this war trouble unsettled us, we have neglected many things. You can do as you please, but I shall keep my book on the table here and read a little every morning as soon as I wake, for I know it will do me good and help me through the day. Then she opened her new book and began to read. Jo put her arm round her and, leaning cheek to cheek, read also with the quiet expression so seldom seen on her restless face. How good Meg is. Come, Amy, let's do as they do. I'll help you with the hard words, and they'll explain things if we don't understand, whispered Beth, very much impressed by the pretty books and her sister's example. I'm glad mine is blue, said Amy. And then the rooms were very still, while the pages were softly turned, and the winter sunshine crept in to touch the bright heads and serious faces with a Christmas greeting. Where is mother? asked Meg, as she and Joe ran down to thank her for their gifts half an hour later. Goodness only knows. Some poor creeter came a beggin, and your ma went straight off to see what was needed. There never was such a woman for giving away fiddles and drink, clothes and fire in, replied Hannah, who had lived with the family since Meg was born, and was considered by them all more as a friend than a servant. She will be back soon, I think, so fry your cakes and have everything ready, said Meg, looking over the presents which were collected in a basket and kept under the sofa ready to be produced at the proper time. Why, where is Amy's bottle of cologne? She added, as the little flask did not appear. She took it out a minute ago and went off with it to put a ribbon on it. Or some such notion, replied Joe, dancing about the room to take the first stiffness off the new army slippers. How nice my handkerchiefs look, don't they? Hannah washed and ironed them for me, and I marked them all myself, said Beth, looking proudly at the somewhat uneven letters which had cost her such labor. Bless the child. She's gone and put mother on them instead of March. How funny, cried Joe, taking one up. Isn't that right? I thought it was better to do it so, because Meg's initials are M.M., and I don't want anyone to use these but Marmy, said Beth, looking troubled. It's all right, dear, and a very pretty idea, quite sensible, too, for no one can ever mistake now. It will please her very much, I know, said Meg with a frown for Joe and a smile for Beth. There's mother. Hide the basket, quick, cried Joe, as a door slammed and steps sounded in the hall. Amy came in hastily and looked rather abashed when she saw her sisters all waiting for her. 
Where have you been? And what are you hiding behind you? Asked Meg, surprised to see by her hood and cloak that lazy Amy had been out so early. Don't laugh at me, Joe. I didn't mean anyone should know till the time came. I only meant to change the little bottle for a big one, and I gave all my money to get it, and I'm truly trying not to be selfish anymore. As she spoke, Amy showed the handsome flask, which replaced the cheap one, and looked so earnest and humble in her little effort to forget herself that Meg hugged her on the spot, and Joe pronounced her a trump, while Beth ran to the window and picked her finest rose to ornament the stately bottle. You see, I felt ashamed of my present, after reading and talking about being good this morning, so I ran round the corner and changed it the minute I was up, and I'm so glad, for mine is the handsomest now. Another bang of the street door sent the basket under the sofa, and the girls to the table, eager for breakfast. Merry Christmas, Marmy. Many of them. Thank you for our books. We read some, and mean to every day, they all cried in chorus. Merry Christmas, little daughters. I'm glad you began at once, and hope you will keep on. But I want to say one word before we sit down. Not far away from here lies a poor woman with a little newborn baby. Six children are huddled into one bed to keep from freezing, for they have no fire. There's nothing to eat over there, and the oldest boy came to tell me they were suffering hunger and cold. My girls, will you give them your breakfast as a Christmas present? They were all unusually hungry, having waited nearly an hour, and for a minute no one spoke, only a minute, for Joe exclaimed impetuously, I'm so glad you came before we began. May I go and help carry the things to the poor little children? asked Beth eagerly. I shall take the cream and the muffins, added Amy, heroically giving up the article she most liked. Meg was already covering the buckwheats and piling the bread into one big plate. I thought you'd do it, said Mrs. March, smiling as if satisfied. You shall all go and help me and when we come back, we will have bread and milk for breakfast and make it up at dinner time. They were soon ready, and the procession set out. Fortunately, it was early, and they went through back streets, so few people saw them, and no one laughed at the queer party. A poor, bare, miserable room it was, with broken windows, no fire, ragged bedclothes, a sick mother, wailing baby, and a group of pale, hungry children cuddled under one old quilt, trying to keep warm. How the big eyes stared, and the blue lips smiled as the girls went in. Ach, mein Gott. It is good angels come to us, said the poor woman, crying for joy. Funny angels in hoods and mittens, said Joe, and set them to laughing. In a few minutes, it really did seem as if kind spirits had been at work there. Hannah, who had carried wood, made a fire and stopped up the broken panes with old hats and her own cloak. Mrs. March gave the mother tea and gruel and comforted her with promises of help, while
she dressed the little baby as tenderly as if it had been her own. The girls, meantime, spread the table, set the children round the fire, and fed them like so many hungry birds, laughing, talking, and trying to understand the funny, broken English. Das ist gut, die Engelkinder, cried the poor things as they ate and warmed their purple hands at the comfortable blaze. The girls had never been called angel children before and thought it very agreeable, especially Joe, who had been considered a Sancho ever since she was born. That was a very happy breakfast, though they didn't get any of it. And when they went away, leaving comfort behind, I think there were not in all the city four merrier people than the hungry little girls who gave away their breakfasts and contented themselves with bread and milk on Christmas morning. That's loving our neighbor better than ourselves, and I like it, said Meg, as they set out their presents while their mother was upstairs collecting clothes for the poor Hummels. Not a very splendid show, but there was a great deal of love done up in the few little bundles, and the tall vase of red roses, white chrysanthemums, and trailing vines, which stood in the middle, gave quite an elegant air to the table. She's coming. Strike up, Beth. Open the door, Amy. Three cheers for Marmy, cried Joe, prancing about while Meg went to conduct Mother to the seat of honor. Beth played her gayest march. Amy threw open the door, and Meg enacted escort with great dignity. Mrs. March was both surprised and touched, and smiled with her eyes full as she examined her presence and read the little notes which accompanied them. The slippers went on at once. A new handkerchief was slipped into her pocket, well scented with Amy's cologne. The rose was fastened in her bosom, and the nice gloves were pronounced a perfect fit. There was a good deal of laughing and kissing and explaining in the simple, loving fashion which makes these home festivals so pleasant at the time, so sweet to remember long afterward, and then all fell to work. The morning charities and ceremonies took so much time that the rest of the day was devoted to preparations for the evening festivities. Being still too young to go often to the theater, and not rich enough to afford any great outlay for private performances, the girls put their wits to work, and necessity, being the mother of invention, made whatever they needed. Very clever were some of their productions. Pasteboard guitars, antique lamps made of old-fashioned butter boats covered with silver paper, gorgeous robes of old cotton, glittering with tin spangles from a pickle factory, and armor covered with the same useful diamond-shaped bits left in sheets when the lids of preserve pots were cut out. The big chamber was the scene of many innocent revels. No gentlemen were admitted, so Joe played male parts to her heart's content and took immense satisfaction in a pair of russet leather boots given her by a friend who knew a lady who knew an actor. These boots, an old foil, and a slashed doublet once used by an artist for some picture, were Joe's chief treasures and appeared on all occasions. The smallness of the company made it necessary for the two principal actors to take several parts apiece, and they 
certainly deserved some credit for the hard work they did in learning three or four different parts. Whisking in and out of various costumes, and managing the stage besides. It was excellent drill for their memories, a harmless amusement, and employed many hours which otherwise would have been idle, lonely, or spent in less profitable society. On Christmas night, a dozen girls piled onto the bed, which was the dress circle, and sat before the blue and yellow chintz curtains in a most flattering state of expectancy. There was a good deal of rustling and whispering behind the curtain, a trifle of lamp smoke, and an occasional giggle from Amy, who was apt to get hysterical in the excitement of the moment. Presently, a bell sounded. The curtains flew apart and the operatic tragedy began. A gloomy wood, according to the one playbill, was represented by a few shrubs in pots, green bays on the floor, and a cave in the distance. This cave was made with a clothes horse for a roof, bureaus for walls, and in it was a small furnace in full blast, with a black pot on it, and an old witch bending over it. The stage was dark, and the glow of the furnace had a fine effect, especially as real steam issued from the kettle when the witch took off the cover. A moment was allowed for the first thrill to subside. Then Hugo, the villain, stalked in with a clanking sword at his side a slouching hat, black beard, mysterious cloak, and the boots. After pacing to and fro in much agitation, he struck his forehead and burst out in a wild strain, singing of his hatred for Roderigo, his love for Zara, and his pleasing resolution to kill the one and win the other. The gruff tones of Hugo's voice, with an occasional shout when his feelings overcame him, were very impressive, and the audience applauded the moment he paused for breath. Bowing with the air of one accustomed to public praise, he stole to the cavern and ordered Hagar to come forth with a commanding, What ho, minion, I need thee. Out came Meg, with gray horsehair hanging about her face, a red and black robe, a staff, and cabalistic signs upon her cloak. Hugo demanded a potion to make Zara adore him, and one to destroy Roderigo. Hagar, in a fine dramatic melody, promised both and proceeded to call up the spirit who would bring the love filter. Hither, hither, from thy home, airy sprite, I bid thee come. Born of roses, fed on dew, charms and potions canst thou brew? Bring me here, with elfin speed, the fragrant filter which I need. Make it sweet and swift and strong, spirit, answer now my song. A soft strain of music sounded, and then at the back of the cave appeared a little figure in cloudy white, with glittering wings, golden hair, and a garland of roses on its head. Waving a wand, it sang, Hither I come from my airy home afar in the silver moon. Take the magic spell and use it well, or its power will vanish soon. And dropping a small 
gilded bottle at the witch's feet. The spirit vanished. Another chant from Hagar produced another apparition, not a lovely one. For with a bang, an ugly black imp appeared, and, having croaked a reply, tossed a dark bottle at Hugo and disappeared with a mocking laugh. Having warbled his thanks and put the potions in his boots, Hugo departed, and Hagar informed the audience that as he had killed a few of her friends in times past, she had cursed him and intends to thwart his plans and be revenged on him. Then the curtain fell, and the audience reposed and ate candy while discussing the merits of the play. A good deal of hammering went on before the curtain rose again, but when it became evident what a masterpiece of stage carpentry had been got up, no one murmured at the delay. It was truly superb. A tower rose to the ceiling. Halfway up appeared a window with a lamp burning in it. And behind the white curtain appeared Zara in a lovely blue and silver dress, waiting for Roderigo. He came in gorgeous array, with plumed cap, red cloak, chestnut love locks, a guitar, and the boots, of course. Kneeling at the foot of the tower, he sang a serenade in melting tones. Zara replied, and, after a musical dialogue, consented to fly. Then came the grand effect of the play. Roderigo produced a rope ladder with five steps to it, threw up one end, and invited Zara to descend. Timidly, she crept from her lattice, put her hand on Roderigo's shoulder, and was about to leap gracefully down when alas, alas for Zara, she forgot her train. It caught in the window. The tower tottered, leaned forward, fell with a crash, and buried the unhappy lovers in the ruins. A universal shriek arose as the russet boots waved wildly from the wreck and a golden head emerged, exclaiming, I told you so, I told you so. With wonderful presence of mind, Don Pedro, the cruel sire, rushed in, dragged out his daughter with a hasty aside. Don't laugh. Act as if it was all right. And, ordering Roderigo up, banished him from the kingdom with wrath and scorn. Though decidedly shaken by the fall from the tower upon him, Roderigo defied the old gentleman and refused to stir. This dauntless example fired Zara. She also defied her sire, and he ordered them both to the deepest dungeons of the castle. A stout little retainer came in with chains and led them away, looking very much frightened and evidently forgetting the speech he ought to have made. Act Third was the castle hall, and here Hagar appeared, having come to free the lovers and finish Hugo. She hears him coming and hides, sees him put the potions into two cups of wine, and bid the timid little servant bear them to the captives in their cells, and tell them I shall come anon. The servant takes Hugo aside to tell him something, and Hagar changes the cups for two others, which are harmless. Ferdinando, the minion, carries them away, and Hagar puts back the cup, which holds the poison meant for Roderigo. 
Hugo, getting thirsty after a long warble, drinks it, loses his wits, and after a good deal of clutching and stamping, falls flat and dies, while Hagar informs him what she has done in a song of exquisite power and melody. This was a truly thrilling scene, though some persons might have thought that the sudden tumbling down of a quantity of long red hair rather marred the effect of the villain's death. He was called before the curtain, and with great propriety appeared, leading Hagar, whose singing was considered more wonderful than all the rest of the performance put together. Act Fourth displayed the despairing Roderigo on the point of stabbing himself because he has been told that Zara has deserted him. Just as the dagger is at his heart, a lovely song is sung under his window, informing him that Zara is true, but in danger, and he can save her if he will. A key is thrown in, which unlocks the door, and in a spasm of rapture, he tears off his chains and rushes away to find and rescue his lady love. Act Fifth opened with a stormy scene between Zara and Don Pedro. He wishes her to go into a convent, but she won't hear of it, and after a touching appeal, is about to faint when Roderigo dashes in and demands her hand. Don Pedro refuses, because he is not rich. They shout and gesticulate tremendously, but cannot agree and Rodrigo is about to bear away the exhausted Zara when the timid servant enters with a letter and a bag from Hagar, who has mysteriously disappeared. The latter informs the party that she bequeaths untold wealth to the young pair and an awful doom to Don Pedro if he doesn't make them happy. The bag is opened and several quarts of tin money shower down upon the stage till it is quite glorified with the glitter. This entirely softens the stern sire. He consents without a murmur. All join in a joyful chorus, and the curtain falls upon the lovers, kneeling to receive Don Pedro's blessing in attitudes of the most romantic grace. Tumultuous applause followed, but received an unexpected check. For the cot bed, on which the dress circle was built, suddenly shut up and extinguished the enthusiastic audience. Roderigo and Don Pedro flew to the rescue, and all were taken out unhurt, though many were speechless with laughter. The excitement had hardly subsided when Hannah appeared with Mrs. March's compliments and with the ladies walked down to supper. This was a surprise, even to the actors, and when they saw the table, they looked at one another in rapturous amazement. It was like Marmy to get up a little treat for them but anything so fine as this was unheard of since the departed days of plenty. There was ice cream, actually two dishes of it, pink and white, and cake and fruit, and distracting French bonbons, and, in the middle of the table, four great bouquets of hot house flowers. It quite took their breath away and they stared first at the table and then at their mother, who looked as if she enjoyed it immensely. Is it fairies? asked Amy. Santa Claus, said Beth. Mother did it. And Meg smiled her sweetest in spite of her gray beard and white eyebrows. 
Aunt March had a good fit and sent the supper, cried Joe, with a sudden inspiration. All wrong. Old Mr. Lawrence sent it, replied Mrs. March. The Lawrence boy's grandfather. What in the world put such a thing into his head? We don't know him, exclaimed Meg. Hannah told one of his servants about your breakfast party. He is an odd old gentleman. But that pleased him. He knew my father years ago, and he sent me a polite note this afternoon, saying he hoped I would allow him to express his friendly feeling toward my children by sending them a few trifles in honor of the day. I could not refuse. And so you have a little feast at night to make up for the bread and milk breakfast. That boy put it into his head. I know he did. He's a capital fellow, and I wish we could get acquainted. He looks as if he'd like to know us, but he's bashful. And Meg is so prim, she won't let me speak to him when we pass, said Joe, as the plates went round. And the ice began to melt out of sight, with ohs and ahs of satisfaction. You mean the people who live in the big house next door, don't you? Asked one of the girls. My mother knows old Mr. Lawrence, but says he's very proud and doesn't like to mix with his neighbors. He keeps his grandson shut up when he isn't riding or walking with his tutor and makes him study very hard. We invited him to our party, but he didn't come. Mother says he's very nice, though he never speaks to us girls. Our cat ran away once, and he brought her back, and we talked over the fence, and we're getting on capitally, all about cricket and so on, when he saw Meg coming and walked off. I mean to know him some day, for he needs fun. I'm sure he does, said Joe decidedly. I like his manners, and he looks like a little gentleman. So I've no objection to your knowing him, if a proper opportunity comes. He brought the flowers himself, and I should have asked him in if I had been sure what was going on upstairs. He looked so wistful as he went away, hearing the frolic, and evidently having none of his own. It's a mercy you didn't, mother, laughed Joe, looking at her boots. But we'll have another play sometime that he can see. Perhaps he'll help act. Wouldn't that be jolly? I never had such a fine bouquet before. How pretty it is. And Meg examined her flowers with great interest. They are lovely. But Beth's roses are sweeter to me, said Mrs. March, smelling the half-dead posy in her belt. Beth nestled up to her and whispered softly, I wish I could send my bunch to father. I'm afraid he isn't having such a merry Christmas as we are. A Christmas Dream and how it came true. I'm so tired of Christmas. I wish there never would be another one, exclaimed a discontented-looking little girl as she sat idly watching her mother arrange a pile of gifts two days before they were to be given. Why, Effie, what a dreadful thing to say. You are as bad as old Scrooge, and I'm afraid something will happen to you, as it did to him, if you don't care for dear Christmas, answered Mama, almost dropping the silver horn she was filling with delicious candies. Who was Scrooge? What happened to him? asked Effie, with a glimmer of interest in her listless face, 
as she picked out the sourest lemon drop she could find, for nothing sweet suited her just then. He was one of Dickens's best people. And you can read the charming story someday. He hated Christmas until a strange dream showed him how dear and beautiful it was and made a better man of him. I shall read it, for I like dreams, and have a great many curious ones myself. But they don't keep me from being tired of Christmas, said Effie, poking discontentedly among the sweeties for something worth eating. Why are you tired of what should be the happiest time of all the year? asked Mama, anxiously. Perhaps I shouldn't be if I had something new, but it is always the same, and there isn't any more surprise about it. I always find heaps of goodies in my stocking. Don't like some of them, and soon get tired of those I do like. We always have a great dinner, and I eat too much and feel ill next day. Then there is a Christmas tree somewhere, with a doll on top, or a stupid old Santa Claus, and children dancing and screaming over bonbons and toys that break, and shiny things that are of no use. Really, Mama, I've had so many Christmases all alike that I don't think I can bear another one. And Effie laid herself flat on the sofa, as if the mere idea was too much for her. Her mother laughed at her despair, but was sorry to see her little girl so discontented when she had everything to make her happy and had known but ten Christmas days. Suppose we don't give you any presents at all. How would that suit you? asked Mama, anxious to please her spoiled child. I should like one large and splendid one and one dear little one to remember some very nice person by, said Effie, who was a fanciful little body, full of odd whims and notions, which her friends loved to gratify, regardless of time, trouble, or money, for she was the last of three little girls, and very dear to all the family. Well, my darling, I will see what I can do to please you, and not say a word until all is ready. If I could only get a new idea to start with. And Mama went on, tying up her pretty bundles with a thoughtful face, while Effie strolled to the window to watch the rain that kept her indoors and made her dismal. Seems to me poor children have better times than rich ones. I can't go out, and there is a girl about my age splashing along, without any maid to fuss about rubbers and cloaks and umbrellas and colds. I wish I was a beggar girl. Would you like to be hungry, cold, and ragged to beg all day and sleep on an ash heap at night? asked Mama, wondering what would come next. Cinderella did, and had a nice time in the end. This girl out here has a basket of scraps on her arm and a big old shawl all round her, and doesn't seem to care a bit, though the water runs out of the toes of her boots. She goes paddling along, laughing at the rain, and eating a cold potato, as if it tasted nicer than the chicken and ice cream I had for dinner. Yes, I do think poor children are happier than rich ones. So do I, sometimes. At the orphan asylum today, I saw two dozen merry little souls who have no parents, no home, and no hope of Christmas beyond a stick of candy or cake. I wish you had been there to see how happy they were, 
playing with the old toys some richer children had sent them. You may give them all mine. I'm so tired of them. I never want to see them again, said Effie, turning from the window to the pretty baby house, full of everything a child's heart could desire. I will, and let you begin again with something you will not tire of, if I can only find it. And Mama knit her brows, trying to discover some grand surprise for this child who didn't care for Christmas. Nothing more was said then, and wandering off to the library, Effie found a Christmas carol, and curling herself up in the sofa corner, it all before tea. Some of it she did not understand, but she laughed and cried over many parts of the charming story and felt better without knowing why. All the evening she thought of poor Tiny Tim, Mrs. Cratchit with the pudding, and the stout old gentleman who danced so gaily that his legs twinkled in the air. Presently, bedtime arrived. Come now and toast your feet, said Effie's nurse, while I do your pretty hair and tell stories. I'll have a fairy tale tonight, a very interesting one, commanded Effie, as she put on her blue silk wrapper and little fur-lined slippers to sit before the fire and have her long curls brushed. So Nursey told her best tales, and when at last the child lay down under her lace curtains, her head was full of a curious jumble of Christmas elves, poor children, snowstorms, sugar plums, and surprises. So it is no wonder that she dreamed all night, and this was the dream which she never quite forgot. She found herself sitting on a stone in the middle of a great field, all alone. The snow was falling fast, a bitter wind whistled by, and night was coming on. She felt hungry, cold, and tired, and did not know where to go nor what to do. I wanted to be a beggar girl, and now I am one, but I don't like it, and wish somebody would come and take care of me. I don't know who I am, and I think I must be lost, thought Effie, with the curious interest one takes in oneself in dreams. But the more she thought about it, the more bewildered she felt. Faster fell the snow, colder blew the wind, darker grew the night, and poor Effie made up her mind that she was quite forgotten and left to freeze alone. The tears were chilled on her cheeks, her feet felt like icicles, and her heart died within her, so hungry. Frightened and forlorn was she. Laying her head on her knees, she gave herself up for lost and sat there with the great flakes fast turning her to a little white mound. When suddenly the sound of music reached her, and starting up, she looked and listened with all her eyes and ears. Far away, a dim light shone, and a voice was heard singing. She tried to run toward the welcome glimmer, but could not stir, and stood like a small statue of expectation while the light drew nearer, and the sweet words of the song grew clearer. From our happy home, through the world we roam, one week in all the year, making winter spring. With the joy we bring, 
for Christmas tide is here. Now the eastern star shines from afar to light the poorest home. Hearts warmer grow, gifts freely flow, for Christmas tide has come. Now gay trees rise before young eyes, a bloom with tempting cheer. Blithe voices sing, and blithe bells ring, for Christmas tide is here. Oh, happy chime, oh, blessed time, that draws us all so near. Welcome, dear day, all creatures say, for Christmas tide is here. A child's voice sang, a child's hand carried the little candle, and in the circle of soft light it shed. Effie saw a pretty child coming to her through the night and snow. A rosy, smiling creature, wrapped in white fur, with a wreath of green and scarlet holly on its shining hair, the magic candle in one hand, and the other outstretched, as if to shower gifts and warmly press all other hands. Effie forgot to speak as this bright vision came nearer, leaving no trace of footsteps in the snow, only lighting the way with its little candle and filling the air with the music of its song. Dear child, you are lost, and I have come to find you, said the stranger, taking Effie's cold hands in his with a smile like sunshine, while every holly berry glowed like a little fire. Do you know me? asked Effie, feeling no fear, but a great gladness at his coming. I know all children, and go to find them, for this is my holiday, and I gather them from all parts of the world to be merry with me once a year. Are you an angel? asked Effie, looking for the wings. No, I am a Christmas spirit, and live with my mates in a pleasant place, getting ready for our holiday, when we are led out to roam about the world, helping make this a happy time for all who will let us in. Will you come and see how we work? I will go anywhere with you. Don't leave me again, cried Effie gladly. First, I will make you comfortable. That is what we love to do. You are cold, and you shall be warm hungry, and I will feed you sorrowful, and I will make you gay. With a wave of his candle, all three miracles were wrought, for the snowflakes turned to a white fur cloak and hood on Effie's head and shoulders. A bowl of hot soup came sailing to her lips and vanished when she had eagerly drunk the last drop. And suddenly, the dismal field changed to a new world so full of wonders that all her troubles were forgotten in a minute. Bells were ringing so merrily that it was hard to keep from dancing. Green garlands hung on the walls, and every tree was a Christmas tree full of toys and blazing with candles that never went out. In one place, many little spirits sewed like mad on warm clothes, turning off work faster than any sewing machine ever invented, and great piles were made ready to be sent to poor people. Other busy creatures packed money into purses and wrote checks, which they sent flying away on the wind. A lovely kind of snowstorm to fall into a world below full of poverty. Older and graver spirits were looking over piles of little books, 
in which the records of the past year were kept, telling how different people had spent it and what sort of gifts they deserved. Some got peace, some disappointment, some remorse and sorrow, some great joy and hope. The rich had generous thoughts sent them the poor, gratitude, and contentment. Children had more love and duty to parents, and parents renewed patience, wisdom, and satisfaction for and in their children. No one was forgotten. Please tell me what splendid place this is, asked Effie, as soon as she could collect her wits after the first look at all these astonishing things. This is the Christmas world, and here we work all the year round, never tired of getting ready for the happy day. See, these are the saints just setting off for some have far to go, and the children must not be disappointed. As he spoke, the spirit pointed to four gates, out of which four great sleighs were just driving, laden with toys, while a jolly old Santa Claus sat in the middle of each, drawing on his mittens and tucking up his wraps for a long, cold drive. Why, I thought there was only one Santa Claus, and even he was a humbug, cried Effie, astonished at the sight. Never give up your faith in the sweet old stories. Even after you come to see that they are only the pleasant shadow of a lovely truth. Just then, the sleighs went off with a great jingling of bells and pattering of reindeer hoofs, while all the spirits gave a cheer that was heard in the lower world, where people said, Hear the stars sing. I never will say there isn't any Santa Claus again. Now, show me more. You will like to see this place, I think, and may learn something here, perhaps. The spirit smiled as he led the way to a little door, through which Effie peeped into a world of dolls. Baby houses were in full blast, with dolls of all sorts going on like live people. Waxen ladies sat in their parlors, elegantly dressed black dolls cooked in the kitchens. Nurses walked out with the bits of dollies, and the streets were full of tin soldiers marching, wooden horses prancing, express wagons rumbling, and little men hurrying to and fro. Shops were there, and tiny people buying legs of mutton, pounds of tea, mites of clothes, and everything dolls use or wear or want. But presently, she saw that in some ways the dolls improved upon the manners and customs of human beings, and she watched eagerly to learn why they did these things. A fine Paris doll driving in her carriage took up a black, worsted Dinah, who was hobbling along with a basket of clean clothes, and carried her to her journey's end, as if it were the proper thing to do. Another interesting China lady took off her comfortable red cloak and put it round a poor wooden creature done up in a paper shift, and so badly painted that its face would have sent some babies into fits. Seems to me I once knew a rich girl who didn't give her things to poor girls. I wish I could remember who she was and tell her to be as kind as that china doll, said Effie much touched at the sweet way the pretty creature wrapped up the poor fright and then ran off in her little gray gown to 
by a shiny fowl stuck on a wooden platter for her invalid mother's dinner. We recall these things to people's minds by dreams. I think the girl you speak of won't forget this one. And the spirit smiled, as if he enjoyed some joke which she did not see. A little bell rang as she looked, and away scampered the children into the red and green schoolhouse with the roof that lifted up. So one could see how nicely they sat at their desks with mites of books, or drew on the inch-square blackboards with crumbs of chalk. They know their lessons very well, and are as still as mice. We make a great racket at our school, and get bad marks every day. I shall tell the girls they had better mind what they do, or their dolls will be better scholars than they are, said Effie, much impressed, as she peeped in and saw no rod in the hand of the little mistress, who looked up and shook her head at the intruder, as if begging her to go away before the order of the school was disturbed. Effie retired at once, but could not resist one look in at the window of a fine mansion, where the family were at dinner. The children behaved so well at table, and never grumbled a bit when their mama said they could not have any more fruit. Now, show me something else, she said as they came again to the low door that led out of Doll Land. You have seen how we prepare for Christmas. Let me show you where we love best to send our good and happy gifts, answered the spirit, giving her his hand again. I know. I've seen ever so many, began Effie, thinking of her own Christmases. No. You have never seen what I will show you. Come away and remember what you see tonight. Like a flash, that bright world vanished, and Effie found herself in a part of the city she had never seen before. It was far away from the gayer places, where every store was brilliant with lights and full of pretty things and every house wore a festival air, while people hurried to and fro with merry greetings. It was down among the dingy streets where the poor lived, and where there was no making ready for Christmas. Hungry women looked in at the shabby shops, longing to buy meat and bread, but empty pockets forbade. Tipsy men drank up their wages in the bar rooms, and in many cold, dark chambers, little children huddled under the thin blankets, trying to forget their misery in sleep. No nice dinners filled the air with savory smells. No gay trees dropped toys and bonbons into eager hands. No little stockings hung in rows beside the chimney piece, ready to be filled no happy sounds of music, gay voices, and dancing feet were heard, and there were no signs of Christmas anywhere. Don't they have any in this place? asked Effie, shivering, as she held fast the spirit's hand, following where he led her. We come to bring it. Let me show you our best workers and the spirit pointed to some sweet-faced men and women who came stealing into the poor houses, working such beautiful miracles that Effie could only stand and watch. Some slipped money into the empty pockets and sent the happy mothers to buy all the comforts they needed. Others led the drunken men out of temptation and took them home to find safer pleasures there. 
Fires were kindled on cold hearths, tables spread as if by magic, and warm clothes wrapped round shivering limbs. Flowers suddenly bloomed in the chambers of the sick old people, found themselves remembered sad hearts were consoled by a tender word, and wicked ones softened by the story of him who forgave all sin. But the sweetest work was for the children, and Effie held her breath to watch these human fairies hang up and fill the little stockings, without which a child's Christmas is not perfect, putting in things that once she would have thought very humble presents, but which now seemed beautiful and precious, because these poor babies had nothing. That is so beautiful. I wish I could make Merry Christmases, as these good people do, and be loved and thanked as they are, said Effie softly, as she watched the busy men and women do their work and steal away without thinking of any reward but their own satisfaction. You can, if you will. I have shown you the way. Try it, and see how happy your own holiday will be hereafter. As he spoke, the spirit seemed to put his arms about her and vanished with a kiss. Oh, stay and show me more, cried Effie, trying to hold him fast. Darling, wake up and tell me why you are smiling in your sleep, said a voice in her ear and opening her eyes. There was Mama bending over her, and morning sunshine streaming into the room. Are they all gone? Did you hear the bells? Wasn't it splendid? she asked, rubbing her eyes, and looking about her for the pretty child who was so real and sweet. You have been dreaming at a great rate, talking in your sleep, laughing, and clapping your hands as if you were cheering someone. Tell me what was so splendid, said Mama, smoothing the tumbled hair and lifting up the sleepy head. Then, while she was being dressed, Effie told her dream, and Nursie thought it very wonderful, but Mama smiled to see how curiously things the child had thought, read, heard, and seen through the day, were mixed up in her sleep. The spirit said, I could work lovely miracles if I tried, but I don't know how to begin, for I have no magic candle to make feasts appear and light up groves of Christmas trees, as he did, said Effie, sorrowfully. Yes, you have. We will do it. We will do it. And clapping her hands, Mama suddenly began to dance all over the room as if she had lost her wits. How? How? You must tell me, Mama, cried Effie, dancing after her, and ready to believe anything possible when she remembered the adventures of the past night. I've got it. I've got it the new idea. A splendid one, if I can only carry it out. And Mama waltzed the little girl round till her curls flew wildly in the air, while Nursie laughed as if she would die. Tell me, tell me, shrieked Effie. No, no, it is a surprise, a grand surprise for Christmas Day sung Mama, evidently charmed with her happy thought. Now come to breakfast, for we must work like bees if we want to play spirits tomorrow. You and Nursie will go out shopping and get heaps of things, while I arrange matters behind the scenes. 
They were running downstairs as Mama spoke, and Effie called out breathlessly. It won't be a surprise, for I know you are going to ask some poor children here and have a tree or something. It won't be like my dream, for they had ever so many trees and more children than we can find anywhere. There will be no tree, no party, no dinner, in this house at all, and no presents for you. Won't that be a surprise? And Mama laughed at Effie's bewildered face. Do it. I shall like it, I think, and I won't ask any questions, so it will all burst upon me when the time comes, she said and she ate her breakfast thoughtfully, for this really would be a new sort of Christmas. All that morning, Effie trotted after Nursie, in and out of shops, buying dozens of barking dogs, woolly lambs, and squeaking birds, tiny tea sets, gay picture books, mittens and hoods, dolls and candy. Parcel after parcel was sent home, but when Effie returned, she saw no trace of them, though she peeped everywhere. Nursie chuckled, but wouldn't give a hint, and went out again in the afternoon with a long list of more things to buy, while Effie wandered forlornly about the house, missing the usual merry stir that went before the Christmas dinner and the evening fun. As for Mama, she was quite invisible all day and came in at night so tired that she could only lie on the sofa to rest, smiling as if some very pleasant thought made her happy in spite of weariness. Is the surprise going on all right? asked Effie, anxiously, for it seemed an immense time to wait till another evening came. Beautifully better than I expected for several of my good friends are helping, or I couldn't have done it as I wish. I know you will like it, dear, and long remember this new way of making Christmas merry. Mama gave her a very tender kiss, and Effie went to bed. The next day was a very strange one, for when she woke, there was no stocking to examine, no pile of gifts under her napkin. No one said Merry Christmas. To her, and the dinner was just as usual to her. Mama vanished again, and Nursie kept wiping her eyes and saying, The dear things, it's the prettiest idea I ever heard of. No one but your blessed Ma could have done it. Do stop, Nursie, or I shall go crazy, because I don't know the secret, cried Effie more than once. And she kept her eye on the clock, for at seven in the evening, the surprise was to come off. The longed-for hour arrived at last and the child was too excited to ask questions when Nurse put on her cloak and hood, led her to the carriage, and they drove away, leaving their house the one dark and silent one in the row. I feel like the girls in the fairy tales who are led off to strange places and see fine things, said Effie in a whisper, as they jingled through the gay streets. Ah, oh, my dearie, it is like a fairy tale, I do assure you, and you will see finer things than most children will tonight. Steady now, and do just as I tell you, and don't say one word, whatever you see, answered Nursie, quite quivering with excitement as she patted a large box in her lap and nodded and laughed with twinkling eyes. They drove into a dark yard, 
and Effie was led through a back door to a little room, where Nurse coolly proceeded to take off not only her cloak and hood, but her dress and shoes also. Effie stared and bit her lips, but kept still, until out of the box came a little white fur coat and boots, a wreath of holly leaves and berries, and a candle with a frill of gold paper round it. A long O oh, escaped her then, and when she was dressed and saw herself in the glass, she started back, exclaiming, Why, Nursey, I look like the spirit in my dream. So you do, and that's the part you are to play, my pretty. Now whist, while I blind your eyes and put you in your place, Shall I be afraid? whispered Effie, full of wonder, for as they went out, she heard the sound of many voices, the tramp of many feet, and, in spite of the bandage, was sure a great light shone upon her when she stopped. You needn't be. I shall stand close by, and your ma will be there. After the handkerchief was tied about her eyes, Nurse led Effie up some steps and placed her on a high platform where something like leaves touched her head and the soft snap of lamps seemed to fill the air. Music began as soon as Nurse clapped her hands. The voices outside sounded nearer and the tramp was evidently coming up the stairs. Now, my precious look and see how you and your dear Ma have made a merry Christmas for them that needed it. Off went the bandage, and for a minute, Effie really did think she was asleep again, for she actually stood in a grove of Christmas trees, all gay and shining as in her vision. Twelve on a side, in two rows down the room, stood the little pines, each on its low table, and behind Effie a taller one rose to the roof, hung with wreaths of popcorn, apples, oranges, horns of candy, and cakes of all sorts, from sugary hearts to gingerbread jumbos. On the smaller trees she saw many of her own discarded toys, and those nursey bought, as well as heaps that seemed to have rained down straight from that delightful Christmas country where she felt as if she was again. How splendid! Who is it for? What is that noise? Where is Mama? cried Effie, pale with pleasure and surprise as she stood looking down the brilliant little street from her high place. Before Nurse could answer, the doors at the lower end flew open, and in marched twenty-four little blue-gowned orphan girls, singing sweetly, until amazement changed the song to cries of joy and wonder as the shining spectacle appeared. While they stood staring with round eyes, at the wilderness of pretty things about them, Mama stepped up beside Effie, and holding her hand fast to give her courage, told the story of the dream in a few simple words, ending in this way. So my little girl wanted to be a Christmas spirit too, and make this a happy day for those who had not as many pleasures and comforts as she has. She likes surprises, and we planned this for you all. She shall play the good fairy and give each of you something from this tree, after which everyone will find her own name on a small tree and can go to enjoy it in her own way. March by, my dears and let us fill your hands. Nobody told them to do it, but all the hands were clapped heartily 
before a single child stirred. Then, one by one, they came to look up wonderingly at the pretty giver of the feast as she leaned down to offer them great yellow oranges, red apples, bunches of grapes, bonbons, and cakes, till all were gone, and a double row of smiling faces turned toward her as the children filed back to their places in the orderly way they had been taught. Then each was led to her own tree by the good ladies who had helped Mama with all their hearts, and the happy hubbub that arose would have satisfied even Santa Claus himself. Shrieks of joy, dances of delight, laughter, and tears. For some tender little things could not bear so much pleasure at once, and sobbed with mouths full of candy and hands full of toys. How they ran to show one another the new treasures. How they peeped and tasted, pulled and pinched, until the air was full of queer noises, the floor covered with papers, and the little trees left bare of all but candles. I don't think heaven can be any gooder than this, sighed one small girl as she looked about her in a blissful maze, holding her full apron with one hand while she luxuriously carried sugar plums to her mouth with the other. Is that a truly angel up there? asked another, fascinated by the little white figure with the wreath on its shining hair, who in some mysterious way had been the cause of all this merrymaking. I wish I dared to go and kiss her for this splendid party, said a lame child, leaning on her crutch, as she stood near the steps wondering how it seemed to sit in a mother's lap, as Effie was doing, while she watched the happy scene before her. Effie heard her, and remembering Tiny Tim, ran down and put her arms about the pale child, kissing the wistful face as she said sweetly, You may, but Mama deserves the thanks. She did it all. I only dreamed about it. Lame Katie felt as if a truly angel was embracing her and could only stammer out her thanks while the other children ran to see the pretty spirit and touch her soft dress until she stood in a crowd of blue gowns laughing as they held up their gifts for her to see and admire. Mama leaned down and whispered one word to the older girls, and suddenly they all took hands to dance round Effie, singing as they skipped. It was a pretty sight, and the ladies found it hard to break up the happy revel, but it was late for small people, and too much fun is a mistake. So the girls fell into line, and marched before Effie and Mama again to say good night with such grateful little faces that the eyes of those who looked grew dim with tears. Mama kissed everyone, and many a hungry, childish heart felt as if the touch of those tender lips was their best gift. Effie shook so many small hands that her own tingled, and when Katie came, she pressed a small doll into Effie's hand, whispering, you didn't have a single present, and we had lots. Do keep that, it's the prettiest thing I got. I will, answered Effie, and held it fast until the last smiling face was gone, the surprise all over and she's safe in her own bed, too tired and happy for anything but sleep. Mama, 
It was a beautiful surprise, and I thank you so much. I don't see how you did it, but I like it best of all the Christmases I ever had, and mean to make one every year. I had my splendid big present, and here is the dear little one to keep for love of poor Katie, so even that part of my wish came true. And Effie fell asleep with a happy smile on her lips, her one humble gift still in her hand, and a new love for Christmas in her heart that never changed through a long life spent in doing good. A Christmas Turkey and How It Came I know we couldn't do it. I say we could if we all helped. How can we? I've planned lots of ways, only you mustn't laugh at them, and you mustn't say a word to Mother. I want it to be all a surprise. She'll find us out. No, she won't, if we tell her we won't get into mischief. Fire away, then and let's hear your fine plans. We must talk softly, or we shall wake Father. He's got a headache. A curious change came over the faces of the two boys as their sister lowered her voice with a nod toward a half-opened door. They looked sad and ashamed, and Kitty sighed as she spoke, for all knew that Father's headaches always began by his coming home stupid or cross, with only a part of his wages, and Mother always cried when she thought they did not see her. And after the long sleep, Father looked as if he didn't like to meet their eyes, but went off early. They knew what it meant, but never spoke of it, only pondered over it, and mourned with Mother at the change which was slowly altering their kind, industrious father into a moody man and mother into an anxious, overworked woman. Kitty was thirteen and a very capable girl who helped with the housekeeping, took care of the two little ones, and went to school. Tommy and Sammy looked up to her and thought her a remarkably good sister. Now, as they sat round the stove, having a go-to-bed warm, the three heads were close together, and the boys listened eagerly to Kitty's plans, while the rattle of the sewing machine in another room went on as tirelessly as it had done all day, for Mother's work was more and more needed every month. Well, began Kitty, in an impressive tone. We all know that there won't be a bit of Christmas in this family if we don't make it. Mother's too busy, and Father don't care, so we must see what we can do, for I should be mortified to death to go to school and say I hadn't had any turkey or plum pudding. Don't expect presents, but we must have some kind of a decent dinner. So I say I'm tired of fish and potatoes, said Sammy, the younger. But where's the dinner coming from, asked Tommy, who had already taken some of the cares of life on his young shoulders, and knew that Christmas dinners did not walk into people's houses without money. We'll earn it, and Kitty looked like a small Napoleon planning the passage of the Alps. You? Tom must go early tomorrow to Mr. Brisket and offer to carry baskets. He will be dreadfully busy and want you, I know, and you are so strong you can lug as much as some of the big fellows. He pays well, and if he won't give much money, you can take your wages in things to eat. 
We want everything. What shall I do? cried Sammy, while Tom sat turning this plan over in his mind. Take the old shovel and clear sidewalks. The snow came on purpose to help you. It's awful hard work, and the shovel's half gone, began Sammy, who preferred to spend his holiday coasting on an old tea tray. Don't growl, or you won't get any dinner, said Tom, making up his mind to lug baskets for the good of the family, like a manly lad as he was. I, continued Kitty, have taken the hardest part of all, for after my work is done, and the babies safely settled, I'm going to beg for the leavings of the holly and pine swept out of the church down below, and make some wreaths and sell them. If you can, put in Tommy, who had tried pencils and failed to make a fortune. Not in the street, cried Sam, looking alarmed. Yes, at the corner of the park. I'm bound to make some money and don't see any other way. I shall put on an old hood and shawl, and no one will know me. Don't care if they do. And Kitty tried to mean what she said, but in her heart she felt that it would be a trial to her pride if any of her schoolmates should happen to recognize her. Don't believe you'll do it. See if I don't, for I will have a good dinner one day in the year. Well, it doesn't seem right for us to do it. Father ought to take care of us, and we only buy some presents with the little bit we earn. He never gives us anything now. And Tommy scowled at the bedroom door, with a strong sense of injury struggling with affection in his boyish heart. Hush, cried Kitty. Don't blame him. Mother says we never must forget he's our father. I try not to, but when she cries, it's hard to feel as I ought. And a sob made the little girl stop short as she poked the fire to hide the trouble in the face that should have been all smiles. For a moment, the room was very still as the snow beat on the window and the firelight flickered over the six shabby little boots put up on the stove hearth to dry. Tommy's cheerful voice broke the silence, saying stoutly, Well, if I've got to work all day, I guess I'll go to bed early. Don't fret, kid. We'll help all we can and have a good time see if we don't. I'll go out real early and shovel like fury. Maybe I'll get a dollar. Would that buy a turkey? asked Sammy, with the air of a millionaire. No. Dear one, big enough for us would cost two, I'm afraid. Perhaps we'll have one sent us. We belong to the church, though folks don't know how poor we are now, and we can't beg. And Kitty bustled about, clearing up, rather exercised in her mind about going and asking for the much-desired fowl. Soon, all three were fast asleep, and nothing but the whir of the machine broke the quiet that fell upon the house. Then, from the inner room, a man came and sat over the fire, with his head in his hands, and his eyes fixed on the ragged little boots left to dry. He had heard the children's talk, and his heart was very heavy as he looked about the shabby room that used to be so neat and pleasant. What he thought no one knows. What he did, we shall see by and by. 
the sorrow and shame and tender silence of his children worked a miracle that night, more lasting and lovely than the white beauty which the snow wrought upon the sleeping city. Bright and early, the boys were away to their work while Kitty sang as she dressed the little sisters, put the house in order, and made her mother smile at the mysterious hints she gave of something splendid which was going to happen. Father was gone, and though all rather dreaded evening, nothing was said, but each worked with a will, feeling that Christmas should be merry in spite of poverty and care. All day, Tommy lugged fat turkeys, roasts of beef, and every sort of vegetable for other people's good dinners on the morrow, wondering meanwhile where his own was coming from. Mr. Brisket had an army of boys trudging here and there, and was too busy to notice any particular lad till the hurry was over, and only a few belated buyers remained to be served. It was late, but the stores kept open, and though so tired he could hardly stand, brave Tommy held on when the other boys left, hoping to earn a trifle more by extra work. He sat down on a barrel to rest during a leisure moment, and presently his weary head nodded sideways into a basket of cranberries, where he slept quietly till the sound of gruff voices roused him. It was Mr. Brisket scolding, because one dinner had been forgotten. I told that rascal Beals to be sure and carry it, for the old gentleman will be in a rage if it doesn't come and take away his custom. Every boy gone, and I can't leave the store, nor you either, Pat, with all the clearing up to do. Here's a buy, sir, slapen elegant fornance the cranberries. Bad luck to him, answered Pat, with a shake that set poor Tom on his legs, wide awake at once. Good luck to him, you mean. Here, what's your name? You take this basket to that number. And I'll make it worth your while, said Mr. Brisket, much relieved by this unexpected help. All right. Sir and Tommy trudged off as briskly as his tired legs would let him, cheering the long, cold walk with visions of the turkey with which his employer might reward him for there were piles of them, and Pat was to have one for his family. His brilliant dreams were disappointed, however, for Mr. Brisket naturally supposed Tom's father would attend to that part of the dinner, and generously heaped a basket with vegetables, rosy apples, and a quart of cranberries. There, if you ain't too tired, you can take one more load to that number, and a Merry Christmas to you, said the stout man, handing over his gift with the promised dollar. Thank you, Sir Goodnight, answered Tom, shouldering his last load with a grateful smile, and trying not to look longingly at the poultry for he had set his heart on at least a skinny bird as a surprise to Kit. Sammy's adventures that day had been more varied, and his efforts more successful, as we shall see in the end, for Sammy was a most engaging little fellow, and no one could look into his blue eyes without wanting to pat his curly yellow head with one hand while the other gave him something. The cares of life had not lessened his confidence in people, and only the most abandoned ruffians had the heart to deceive or disappoint him. 
his very tribulations usually led to something pleasant. And whatever happened, Sunshiny Sam came right side up, lucky and laughing. Undaunted by the drifts or the cold wind, he marched off with the remains of the old shovel to seek his fortune and found it at the third house where he called. The first two sidewalks were easy jobs, and he pocketed his ninepences with a growing conviction that this was his chosen work. The third sidewalk was a fine, long one, for the house stood on the corner and two pavements must be cleared. It ought to be fifty cents, but perhaps they won't give me so much. I'm such a young one. I'll show them. I can work, though. Like a man. And Sammy rang the bell with the energy of a telegraph boy. Before the bell could be answered, a big boy rushed up, exclaiming roughly, Get out of this. I'm going to have the job. You can't do it. Start now, or I'll chuck you into a snowbank. I won't, answered Sammy, indignant at the brutal tone and unjust claim. I got here first, and it's my job. You let me alone. I ain't afraid of you or your snowbanks either. The big boy wasted no time in words, for steps were heard inside, but after a brief scuffle, hauled Sammy, fighting bravely all the way, down the steps, and tumbled him into a deep drift. Then he ran up the steps and respectfully asked for the job when a neat maid opened the door. He would have got it if Sam had not roared out. As he floundered in the drift, I came first. He knocked me down, cause I am the smallest. Please let me do it, please. Before another word could be said, a little old lady appeared in the hall, trying to look stern and failing entirely, because she was the picture of a dear, fat, cozy grandma. Send that bad big boy away, Maria, and call in the poor little fellow. I saw the whole thing, and he shall have the job if he can do it. The bully slunk away, and Sammy came panting up the steps, white with snow, a great bruise on his forehead and a beaming smile on his face, looking so like a jolly little Santa Claus who had taken a header out of his sleigh that the maid laughed, and the old lady exclaimed, Bless the boy. He's dreadfully hurt and doesn't know it. Come in and be brushed and get your breath, child, and tell me how that scamp came to treat you so. Nothing loath to be comforted, Sammy told his little tale while Maria dusted him off on the mat, and the old lady hovered in the doorway of the dining room, where a nice breakfast smoked and smelled so deliciously that the boy sniffed the odor of coffee and buckwheats like a hungry hound. He'll get his death if he goes to work till he's dried a bit. Put him over the register, Maria, and I'll give him a hot drink, for it's bitter cold, poor dear. Away trotted the kind old lady, and in a minute came back with coffee and cakes, on which Sammy feasted as he warmed his toes and told Kitty's plans for Christmas, led on by the old lady's questions, and quite unconscious that he was letting all sorts of cats out of the bag. Mrs. Bryant understood the little story and made her plans also, for the rosy-faced boy was very like a little grandson who died last year, 
and her sad old heart was very tender to all other small boys. So she found out where Sammy lived, and nodded and smiled at him most cheerily as he tugged stoutly away at the snow on the long pavements till all was done, and the little workman came for his wages. A bright silver dollar and a pocket full of gingerbread sent him off a rich and happy boy to shovel and sweep till noon, when he proudly showed his earnings at home and feasted the babies on the carefully hoarded cake, for Dilly and Dot were the idols of the household. Now, Sammy, dear, I want you to take my place here this afternoon, for Mother will have to take her work home by and by, and I must sell my wreaths. I only got enough green for six and two bunches of holly, but if I can sell them for ten or twelve cents apiece, I shall be glad. Girls never can earn as much money as boys somehow, sighed Kitty, surveying the thin wreaths tied up with carpet ravelings and vainly puzzling her young wits over a sad problem. I'll give you some of my money. If you don't get a dollar, then we'll be even. Men always take care of women, you know, and ought to, cried Sammy, setting a fine example to his father, if he had only been there to profit by it. With thanks, Kitty left him to rest on the old sofa, while the happy babies swarmed over him and putting on the shabby hood and shawl, she slipped away to stand at the park gate, modestly offering her little wares to the passers-by. A nice old gentleman bought two, and his wife scolded him for getting such bad ones, but the money gave more happiness than any other he spent that day. A child took a ten-cent bunch of holly with its red berries, and there Kitty's market ended. It was very cold. People were in a hurry. Bolder hucksters pressed before the timid little girl, and the balloon man told her to clear out. Hoping for better luck, she tried several other places, but the short afternoon was soon over. The streets began to thin. The keen wind chilled her to the bone and her heart was very heavy to think that in all the rich, merry city, where Christmas gifts passed her in every hand, there were none for the dear babies and boys at home, and the Christmas dinner was a failure. I must go and get supper anyway, and I'll hang these up in our own rooms, as I can't sell them, said Kitty wiping a very big tear from her cold cheek and turning to go away. A smaller, shabbier girl than herself stood near, looking at the bunch of holly with wistful eyes and glad to do to others as she wished someone would do to her. Kitty offered the only thing she had to give, saying kindly, You may have it Merry Christmas and ran away before the delighted child could thank her. I am very sure that one of the spirits who fly about at this season of the year saw the little act, made a note of it, and in about fifteen minutes rewarded Kitty for her sweet remembrance of the golden rule. As she went sadly homeward, she looked up at some of the big houses where every window shone with the festivities of Christmas Eve, and more than one tear fell, for the little girl found life pretty hard just then. There don't seem to be any wreaths at these windows. Perhaps they'd buy mine. I can't bear to go home with so little for my share, she said, stopping before one of the biggest and brightest of these fairy palaces, where the sound of music was heard, and many little heads peeped from behind the curtains, as if watching for someone. 
Kitty was just going up the steps to make another trial when two small boys came racing round the corner, slipped on the icy pavement, and both went down with a crash that would have broken older bones. One was up in a minute, laughing the other, lay squirming and howling, oh, my knee, my knee, till Kitty ran and picked him up with the motherly consolation she had learned to give. It's broken, I know it is, wailed the small sufferer as Kitty carried him up the steps while his friend wildly rang the doorbell. It was like going into fairyland, for the house was all astir with a children's Christmas party. Servants flew about with smiling faces, open doors, gave ravishing glimpses of a feast in one room and a splendid tree in another, while a crowd of little faces peered over the balusters in the hall above, eager to come down and enjoy the glories prepared for them. A pretty young girl came to meet Kitty and listened to her story of the accident, which proved to be less severe than it at first appeared for Bertie, the injured party, forgot his anguish at sight of the tree, and hopped upstairs so nimbly that everyone laughed. He said his leg was broken, but I guess he's all right, said Kitty, reluctantly turning from this happy scene to go out into the night again. Would you like to see our tree before the children come down? asked the pretty girl, seeing the wistful look in the child's eyes and the shine of half-dried tears on her cheek. Oh, yes, I never saw anything so lovely. I'd like to tell the babies all about it. And Kitty's face beamed at the prospect, as if the kind words had melted all the frost away. How many babies are there? asked the pretty girl. As she led the way, into the brilliant room. Kitty told her, adding several other facts, for the friendly atmosphere seemed to make them friends at once. I will buy the wreaths, for we haven't any, said the girl in silk, as Kitty told how she was just coming to offer them when the boys fell. It was pretty to see how carefully the little hostess laid away the shabby garlands and slipped a half dollar into Kitty's hand, prettier still, to watch the sly way in which she tucked some bonbons, a red ball, a blue whip, two china dolls, two pairs of little mittens, and some gilded nuts into an empty box for the babies and prettiest of all, to see the smiles and tears make April in Kitty's face as she tried to tell her thanks for this beautiful surprise. The world was all right when she got into the street again and ran home with the precious box hugged close, feeling that at last she had something to make a merry Christmas of. Shrieks of joy greeted her, for Sammy's nice old lady had sent a basket full of pies, nuts, and raisins, oranges, and cake, and, oh, happy Sammy. A sled, all for love of the blue eyes that twinkled so merrily when he told her about the tea tray, piled upon this red car of triumph, Dilly and Dot were being dragged about while the other treasures were set forth on the table. I must show mine, cried Kitty. We'll look at them tonight and have them tomorrow. And amid more cries of rapture, her box was unpacked. Her money added to the pile in the middle of the table, where Sammy had laid his handsome contribution 
toward the turkey. Before the story of the splendid tree was over, in came Tommy with his substantial offering and his hard-earned dollar. I'm afraid I ought to keep my money for shoes. I've walked the soles off these today and can't go to school barefooted, he said, bravely trying to put the temptation of skates behind him. We have got a good dinner without a turkey, and perhaps we'd better not get it, added Kitty with a sigh as she surveyed the table, and remembered the blue-knit hood marked 75 cents that she saw in a shop window. Oh, we must have a turkey. We worked so hard for it. And it's so Christmassy, cried Sam, who always felt that pleasant things ought to happen. Must have turty, echoed the babies, as they eyed the dolls tenderly. You shall have a turkey. And there he is, said an unexpected voice, as a noble bird fell upon the table and lay there kicking up his legs as if enjoying the surprise immensely. It was father's voice, and there stood father, neither cross nor stupid, but looking as he used to look, kind and happy, and beside him was mother smiling as they had not seen her smile for months. It was not because the work was well paid for and more promised, but because she had received a gift that made the world bright, a home happy again. Father's promise to drink no more. I've been working today as well as you, and you may keep your money for yourselves. There are shoes for all, and never again, please God, shall my children be ashamed of me or want a dinner Christmas Day. As father said this with a choke in his voice, and mother's head went down on his shoulder to hide the happy tears that wet her cheeks, the children didn't know whether to laugh or cry till Kitty, with the instinct of a loving heart, settled the question by saying, as she held out her hands, we haven't any tree, so let's dance around our goodies and be merry. Then the tired feet in the old shoes forgot their weariness, and five happy little souls skipped gaily round the table where, in the midst of all the treasures earned and given, Father's Christmas turkey proudly lay in state. Sophie's Secret 1. A party of young girls, in their gay bathing dresses, were sitting on the beach, waiting for the tide to rise a little higher before they enjoyed the daily frolic, which they called mermaiding. I wish we could have a clam bake, but we haven't any clams, and don't know how to cook them if we had. It's such a pity all the boys have gone off on that stupid fishing excursion, said one girl, in a yellow and black striped suit, which made her look like a wasp. What is a clam bake? I do not know that kind of fate, asked a pretty brown-eyed girl, with an accent that betrayed the foreigner. The girls laughed at such sad ignorance, and Sophie colored, wishing she had not spoken. Poor thing, she has never tasted a clam. What should we do if we went to Switzerland, said the wasp loved to tease. We should give you the best we had, and not laugh at your ignorance if you did not know all our dishes. In my country, we have politeness, 
though not the clam bake, answered Sophie, with a flash of the brown eyes, which warned Naughty D to desist. We might row to the lighthouse and have a picnic supper. Our mamas will let us do that alone, suggested Dora, from the roof of the bathhouse, where she perched like a flamingo. That's a good idea, cried Fanny, a slender brown girl who sat dabbling her feet in the water with her hair streaming in the wind. Sophie should see that and get some of the shells she likes so much. You are kind to think of me. I shall be glad to have a necklace of the pretty things as a souvenir of this so charming place and my good friend, answered Sophie, with a grateful look at Fanny, whose many attentions had won the stranger's heart. Those boys haven't left us a single boat, so we must dive off the rocks. And that isn't half so nice, said Dee, to change the subject, being ashamed of her rudeness. A boat is just coming round the point. Perhaps we can hire that and have some fun, cried Dora from her perch. There is only a girl in it. I'll hail her when she is near enough. Sophie looked about her to see where the hail was coming from, but the sky was clear, and she waited to see what new meaning this word might have not daring to ask for fear of another laugh. While the girls watched the boat float around the farther horn of the crescent-shaped beach, we shall have time to say a few words about our little heroine. She was a 16-year-old Swiss girl on a visit to some American friends and had come to the seaside for a month with one of them who was an invalid. This left Sophie to the tender mercies of the young people, and they gladly welcomed the pretty creature with her fine manners, foreign ways, and many accomplishments. But she had a quick temper, a funny little accent, and dressed so very plainly that the girls could not resist criticizing and teasing her in a way that seemed very ill-bred and unkind to the newcomer. Their free and easy ways astonished her. Their curious language bewildered her, and their ignorance of many things she had been taught made her wonder at the American education she had heard so much praised. All had studied French and German, yet few read or spoke either tongue correctly, or understood her easily when she tried to talk to them. Their music did not amount to much, and in the games they played, their want of useful information amazed Sophie. One did not know the signs of the zodiac, another could only say of cotton that it was stuff that grew down south, and a third was not sure whether a frog was an animal or a reptile. While the handwriting and spelling displayed on these occasions left much to be desired. Yet all were fifteen or sixteen, and would soon leave school finished, as they expressed it, but not furnished, as they should have been, with a solid, sensible education. Dress was an all-absorbing topic, sweetmeats their delight, and in confidential moments, sweethearts were discussed with great freedom. Fathers were conveniences, mothers comforters, brothers plagues, and sisters ornaments or playthings, according to their ages. They were not hard-hearted girls, only frivolous, idle, and fond of fun, and poor little Sophie amused them immensely, till they learned to admire, love, 
and respect her. Coming straight from Paris, they expected to find that her trunks contained the latest fashions for demoiselles, and begged to see her dresses with girlish interest. But when Sophie obligingly showed a few simple but pretty and appropriate gowns and hats, they exclaimed with one voice, Why, you dress like a little girl. Don't you have ruffles and lace on your dresses and silks and high-heeled boots and long gloves and bustles and corsets and things like ours? I am a little girl, laughed Sophie, hardly understanding their dismay. What should I do with fine toilets at school? My sisters go to balls in silk and lace, but I... Not yet. How queer. Is your father poor? Asked Dee with Yankee bluntness. We have enough, answered Sophie, slightly knitting her dark brows. How many servants do you keep? But five, now that the little ones are grown up. Have you a piano? Continued undaunted Dee while the others affected to be looking at the books and pictures strewn about by the hasty unpacking. We have two pianos, four violins, three flutes, and an organ. We love music, and all play, from Papa to little Franz. My gracious, how swell. You must live in a big house to hold all that and eight brothers and sisters. We are not peasants. We do not live in a hut. Voila, this is my home. And Sophie laid before them a fine photograph of a large and elegant house on lovely Lake Geneva. It was droll to see the change in the faces of the girls as they looked, admired, and slyly nudged one another, enjoying Saucy Dee's astonishment. For she had stoutly insisted that the Swiss girl was a poor relation. Sophie, meanwhile, was folding up her plain pique and muslin frocks, with a glimmer of mirthful satisfaction in her eyes, and a tender pride in the work of loving hands now far away. Kind. Fanny saw a little quiver of the lips as she smoothed the blue cornflowers in the best hat and put her arm around Sophie, whispering, Never mind, dear. They don't mean to be rude. It's only our Yankee way of asking questions. I like all your things, and that hat is perfectly lovely. Indeed, yes. Dear Mama arranged it for me. I was thinking of her and longing for my morning kiss. Do you do that every day? Asked Fanny, forgetting herself in her sympathetic interest. Surely, yes. Papa and Mama sit always on the sofa, and we all have the handshake and the embrace each day before our morning coffee. I do not see that here, answered Sophie, who sorely missed the affectionate respect foreign children give their parents. Haven't time, said Fanny, smiling too, at the idea of American parents sitting still for five minutes in the busiest part of the busy day to kiss their sons and daughters. It is what you call old-fashioned, but a sweet fashion to me. And since I have not the dear warm cheeks to kiss, I embrace my pictures often. See, I have them all. And Sophie unfolded a Russia leather case, displaying with pride a long row of handsome brothers and sisters with the parents in the midst. More exclamations from the girls. 
and increased interest in Wilhelmina Tell, as they christened the loyal Swiss maiden, who was now accepted as a companion and soon became a favorite with old and young. They could not resist teasing her, however. Her mistakes were so amusing, her little flashes of temper so dramatic, and her tongue so quick to give a sharp or witty answer when the new language did not perplex her. But Fanny always took her part and helped her in many ways. Now they sat together on the rock, a pretty pair of mermaids with wind-tossed hair, wave-washed feet, and eyes fixed on the approaching boat. The girl who sat in it was a great contrast to the gay creatures grouped so picturesquely on the shore, for the old straw hat shaded a very anxious face. The brown calico gown covered a heart full of hopes and fears, and the boat that drifted so slowly with the incoming tide carried Tilly Reed like a young Columbus toward the new world she longed for, believed in, and was resolved to discover. It was a weather-beaten little boat, yet very pretty for a pile of nets lay at one end, a creel of red lobsters at the other, and all between stood baskets of berries and water lilies, purple marsh rosemary, and orange butterfly weed, shells, and great smooth stones, such as artists like to paint little sea views on. A tame gull perched on the prow, and the morning sunshine glittered from the blue water to the bluer sky. Oh, how pretty! Come on, please! and sell us some lilies, cried Dora, and roused Tilly from her waking dream. Pushing back her hat, she saw the girls beckoning, felt that the critical moment had come, and catching up her oars, rowed bravely on, though her cheeks reddened and her heart beat, for this venture was her last hope and on its success depended the desire of her life. As the boat approached, the watchers forgot its cargo to look with surprise and pleasure at its rower, for she was not the rough country lass they expected to see, but a really splendid girl of fifteen, tall, broad-shouldered, bright-eyed, and blooming with a certain shy dignity of her own and a very sweet smile, as she nodded and pulled in with strong, steady strokes. Before they could offer help, she had risen, planted an oar in the water, and leaping to the shore, pulled her boat high up on the beach, offering her wares with wistful eyes and a very expressive wave of both brown hands. Everything is for sale if you'll buy, said she, charmed with the novelty of this little adventure. The girls, after scampering to the bathing houses for purses and portemonnaies, crowded around the boat like butterflies about a thistle, all eager to buy and to discover who this bonny fisher maiden might be. Oh, see these beauties. A dozen lilies for me. All the yellow flowers for me. They'll be so becoming at the dance tonight. Ow. That lob bites awfully. Where do you come from? Why have we never seen you before? These were some of the exclamations and questions showered upon Tilly as she filled little birch-bark panniers with berries, dealt out flowers, 
or dispensed handfuls of shells. Her eyes shone, her cheeks glowed, and her heart danced in her bosom. For this was a better beginning than she had dared to hope for. And as the dimes tinkled into the tin pail she used for her till, it was the sweetest music she had ever heard. This hearty welcome banished her shyness, and in these eager, girlish customers, she found it easy to confide. I'm from the lighthouse. You have never seen me, because I never came before, except with fish for the hotel. But I mean to come every day, if folks will buy my things, for I want to make some money and this is the only way in which I can do it. Sophie glanced at the old hat and worn shoes of the speaker, and dropping a bright half dollar into the pail, said in her pretty way, For me, all these lovely shells. I will make necklaces of them for my people at home as souvenirs of this charming place. If you will bring me more, I shall be much grateful to you. Oh, thank you. I'll bring heaps I know where to find beauties in places where other folks can't go. Please take these. You paid too much for the shells, and quick to feel the kindness of the stranger. Tilly put into her hands a little bark canoe heaped with red raspberries. Not to be outdone by the foreigner, the other girls emptied their purses, and Tilly's boat, also, of all but the lobsters, which were ordered for the hotel. Is that jolly bird for sale? asked Di, as the last berry vanished, pointing to the gull, who was swimming near them, while the chatter went on. If you can catch him, laughed Tilly, whose spirits were now the gayest of the party. The girls dashed into the water and with shrieks of merriment swam away to capture the gull, who paddled off as if he enjoyed the fun as much as they. Leaving them to splash vainly to and fro, Tilly swung the creel to her shoulder and went off to leave her lobsters, longing to dance and sing to the music of the silver clinking in her pocket. When she came back, the bird was far out of reach, and the girls diving from her boat, which they had launched without leave. Too happy to care what happened now, Tilly threw herself down on the warm sand to plan a new and still finer cargo for next day. Sophie came and sat beside her while she dried her curly hair, and in five minutes her sympathetic face and sweet ways had won Tilly to tell all her hopes and cares and dreams. I want schooling, and I mean to have it. I've got no folks of my own, and uncle has married again, so he doesn't need me now. If I only had a little money, I could go to school somewhere and take care of myself. Last summer, I worked at the hotel, but I didn't make much and had to have good clothes, and that took my wages pretty much. Sewing is slow work, and baby tending leaves me no time to study, so I've kept on at home picking berries and doing what I could to pick up enough to buy books. Aunt thinks I'm a fool, but uncle, he says, go ahead, girl, and see what you can do. And I mean to show him. Tilly's brown hand came down on the sand with a resolute thump, and her clear young eyes looked bravely out across the wide sea 
as if far away in the blue distance, she saw her hope happily fulfilled. Sophie's eyes shone approval, for she understood this love of independence. It had come to America because she longed for new scenes and greater freedom than her native land could give her. Education is a large word, and both girls felt that desire for self-improvement that comes to all energetic natures. Sophie had laid a good foundation, but still desired more, while Tilly was just climbing up the first steep slope, which rises to the heights few attain, yet all may strive for. That is beautiful. You will do it. I am glad to help you if I may. See, I have many books. Will you take some of them? Come to my room tomorrow and take what will best please you. We will say nothing of it, and it will make me a truly great pleasure. As Sophie spoke, her little white hand touched the strong, sunburned one that turned to meet and grasp hers with grateful warmth, while Tilly's face betrayed the hunger that possessed her, for it looked as a starving girl's would look when offered a generous meal. I will come. Thank you so much. I don't know anything, but just blunder along and do the best I can. I got so discouraged. I was real desperate and thought I'd have one try and see if I couldn't earn enough to get books to study this winter. Folks buy berries at the cottages, so I just added flowers and shells, and I'm going to bring my boxes of butterflies, bird's eggs, and seaweeds. I've got lots of such things, and people seem to like spending money down here. I often wish I had a little of what they throw away. Tilly paused with a sigh, then laughed as an impatient movement caused a silver clink, and slapping her pocket, she added gaily, I won't blame them if they'll only throw their money in here. Sophie's hand went involuntarily toward her own pocket, where lay a plump purse, for Papa was generous, and simple Sophie had few wants but something in the intelligent face opposite made her hesitate to offer as a gift what she felt sure Tilly would refuse, preferring to earn her education if she could. Come often, then, and let me exchange these stupid bills for the lovely things you bring. We will come this afternoon to see you if we may, and I shall like the butterflies. I try to catch them, but people tell me I am too old to run, so I have not many. Proposed in this way, Tilly fell into the little trap and presently rode away with all her might to set her possessions in order and put her precious earnings in a safe place. The mermaids clung about the boat as long as they dared making a pretty tableau for the artists on the rocks, then swam to shore, more than ever eager for the picnic on Lighthouse Island. They went and had a merry time while Tilly did the honors and showed them a room full of treasures gathered from earth, air, and water, for she led a lonely life and found friends among the fishes made playmates of the birds, and studied rocks and flowers, clouds and waves, when books were wanting. The girls bought gulls' wings for their hats, queer and lovely shells, eggs and insects, seaweeds and carved wood, and for their small brothers, birch baskets 
and toy ships made by Uncle Hiram, who had been a sailor. When Tilly had sold nearly everything she possessed, for Fanny and Sophie bought whatever the others declined, she made a fire of driftwood on the rocks, cooked fish for supper, and kept them till moonrise, telling sea stories or singing old songs, as if she could not do enough for these good fairies who had come to her when life looked hardest and the future very dark. Then she rode them home, and promising to bring loads of fruit and flowers every day, went back along a shining road to find a great bundle of books in her dismantled room, and to fall asleep with wet eyelashes and a happy heart. 2. For a month, Tilly went daily to the point with a cargo of pretty merchandise, for her patrons increased, and soon the ladies engaged her berries. The boys ordered boats enough to supply a navy. The children clamored for shells, and the girls depended on her for bouquets and garlands for the dances that ended every summer day. For a month, Tilly went daily to the point with a cargo of pretty merchandise, for her patrons increased, and soon the ladies engaged her berries. The boys ordered boats enough to supply a navy. The children clamored for shells, and the girls depended on her for bouquets and garlands for the dances that ended every summer day. Uncle Hiram's fish was in demand when such a comely saleswoman offered it, so he let Tilly have her way glad to see the old tobacco pouch in which she kept her cash fill fast with well-earned money. She really began to feel that her dream was coming true, and she would be able to go to the town and study in some great school, eking out her little fund with light work. The other girls soon lost their interest in her, but Sophie never did and many a book went to the island in the empty baskets. Many a helpful word was said over the lilies, or wild honeysuckle Sophie loved to wear. And many a lesson was given in the bare room in the lighthouse tower, which no one knew about, but the gulls and the sea winds sweeping by the little window, where the two heads leaned together over one page. You will do it, Tilly, I am very sure. Such a will and such a memory will make a way for you, and one day I shall see you teaching as you wish. Keep the brave heart, and all will be well with you, said Sophie, when the grand breaking up came in September, and the girls were parting down behind the deserted bathhouses. Oh, Miss Sophie, what should I have done without you? Don't think I haven't seen and known all the kind things you have said and done for me. I'll never forget them, and I do hope I'll be able to thank you some day," cried grateful Tilly, with tears in her clear eyes that seldom wept over her own troubles. I am thanked if you do well. Adieu, write to me, and remember always that I am your friend. Then they kissed with girlish warmth, and Tilly rowed away to the lonely island while Sophie lingered on the shore, her handkerchief fluttering in the wind, till the boat vanished and the waves had washed away their footprints on the sand. 3. 
December snow was falling fast, and the wintry wind whistled through the streets. But it was warm and cozy in the luxurious parlor, where Dee and Doe were sitting making Christmas presents, and planning what they would wear at the party Fanny was to give on Christmas Eve. If I can get Mama to buy me a new dress, I shall have something yellow. It is always becoming to brunettes, and I'm so tired of red, said Dee, giving a last touch to the lace that trimmed a blue satin sachet for Fanny. That will be lovely. I shall have pink with roses of the same color. Under muslin, it is perfectly sweet. And Dora eyed the sunflower she was embroidering as if she already saw the new toilet before her. Fan always wears blue, so we shall make a nice contrast. She is coming over to show me about finishing off my banner screen, and I asked Sophie to come with her. I want to know what she is going to wear, said Dee, taking a little sniff at the violet-scented bag. That old white cashmere, just think. I asked her why she didn't get a new one, and she laughed and said she couldn't afford it. Fan told me Sophie's father sent her a hundred dollars not long ago, yet she hasn't got a thing that we know of. I do think she's mean. She bought a great bundle of books. I was there when the parcel came, and I peeped while she was out of the room, because she put it away in a great hurry. I'm afraid she is mean, for she never buys a bit of candy and she wears shabby boots and gloves, and she is made over her old hat instead of having that lovely one with the pheasant's breast in it. She's very queer, but I can't help liking her. She's so pretty and bright and obliging. I'd give anything if I could speak three languages and play as she does. So would I. It seems so elegant to be able to talk to foreigners. Papa had some Frenchmen to dinner the other day, and they were so pleased to find they needn't speak English to Sophie. I couldn't get on at all, and I was so mortified when Papa said all the money he had spent on my languages was thrown away. I wouldn't mind. It's so much easier to learn those things abroad. She would be a goose if she didn't speak French better than we do. There's Fan. She looks as if something had happened. I hope no one is ill and the party spoiled. As Dora spoke, both girls looked out to see Fanny shaking the snow from her sealskin sack on the doorstep. Then Doe hastened to meet her, while Dee hid the sachet and was hard at work on an old gold sofa cushion when the newcomer entered. What's the matter? Where's Sophie? exclaimed the girls together, as Fan threw off her wraps and sat down with a tragic sigh. She will be along in a few minutes. I'm disappointed in her. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen them. Promise not to breathe a word to a living soul, and I'll tell you something dreadful, began Fanny, in a tone that caused her friends to drop their work and draw their chairs nearer, as they solemnly vowed eternal silence. I've seen Sophie's Christmas presents, all but mine, and they are just nothing at all. She hasn't bought a thing, not even ribbons, lace, or silk, to make up prettily as we do. 
only a painted shell for one, an acorn emery for another, her ivory fan with a new tassel for a third, and I suspect one of those nice handkerchiefs embroidered by the nuns for me, or her silver filigree necklace. I saw the box in the drawer with the other things. She's knit woolen cuffs and tippets for the children, and got some eight-cent calico gowns for the servants. I don't know how people do things in Switzerland, but I do know that if I had a hundred dollars in my pocket, I would be more generous than that. As Fanny paused, out of breath, Dee and Doe groaned in sympathy, for this was indeed a sad state of things, because the girls had a code that Christmas, being the season for gifts, extravagance would be forgiven then, as at no other time. I have a lovely smelling bottle for her, but I've a great mind not to give it now, cried Dee, feeling defrauded of the bracelet she had plainly hinted she would like. I shall heap coals of fire on her head by giving her that, and Dora displayed a very useless but very pretty apron of muslin, lace, and carnation ribbon. It is int the worth of the things. I don't care for that, so much as I do for being disappointed in her. And I have been lately in more ways than one, said Fanny, listlessly taking up the screen she was to finish. She used to tell me everything, and now she doesn't. I'm sure she has some sort of a secret and I do think I ought to know it. I found her smiling over a letter one day, and she whisked it into her pocket and never said a word about it. I always stood by her, and I do feel hurt. I should think you might. It's real naughty of her, and I shall tell her so. Perhaps she'll confide in you then. And you can just give me a hint. I always liked Sophie, and never thought of not giving my present, said Dora, persuasively. For both girls were now dying with curiosity to know the secret. I'll have it out of her, without any dodging or bribing. I'm not afraid of anyone, and I shall ask her straight out no matter how much she scowls at me, said Dauntless D, with a threatening nod. There she is. Let us see you do it now, cried Fanny, as the bell rang, and a clear voice was heard a moment later, asking if Mademoiselle was in. You shall. And D looked ready for any audacity. I'll wager a box of candy that you don't find out a thing, whispered Do. Done, answered Dee, and then turned to meet Sophie, who came in looking as fresh as an alpine rose with the wintry wind. You dear thing, we were just talking of you. Sit here and get warm, and let us show you our gifts. We are almost done, but it seems as if it got to be a harder job each Christmas. Don't you find it so? But no, I think it the most charming work of all the year, answered Sophie, greeting her friend and putting her well-worn boots toward the fire to dry. Perhaps you don't make as much of Christmas as we do, or give such expensive presents. That would make a great difference, you know, said Dee, as she lifted a cloth from the table where her own generous store of gifts was set forth. I had a piano last year, a set of jewels, and many pretty trifles from all at home. Here is one, 
and pulling the fine gold chain hidden under her frills. Sophie showed a locket, set thick with pearls, containing a picture of her mother. It must be so nice to be rich and able to make such fine presents. I've got something for you, but I shall be ashamed of it after I see your gift to me, I'm afraid. Fan and Dora were working as if their bread depended on it, while Dee, with a naughty twinkle in her eye, affected to be rearranging her pretty table as she talked. Do not fear that my gifts this year are very simple ones. I did not know your custom, and now it is too late. My comfort is that you need nothing. And having so much, you will not care for my, what you call, coming short. Was it the fire that made Sophie's face look so hot? and a cold that gave a husky sort of tone to her usually clear voice. A curious expression came into her face as her eyes roved from the table to the gay trifles in her friend's hands, and she opened her lips as if to add something impulsively. But nothing came, and for a moment she looked straight out at the storm as if she had forgotten where she was. Shortcoming is the proper way to speak it, but never mind that, and tell me why you say, too late, asked Dee, bent on winning her wager. Christmas comes in three days, and I have no time, began Sophie. But with money, one can buy plenty of lovely things in one day, said Dee. No, it is better to put a little love and hard work into what we give to friends. I have done that with my trifles. And another year, I shall be more ready. There was an uncomfortable pause, for Sophie did not speak with her usual frankness, but looked both proud and ashamed, and seemed anxious to change the subject as she began to admire Dora's work, which had made very little progress during the last fifteen minutes. Fanny glanced at Dee with a smile that made the other toss her head and return to the charge with renewed vigor. Sophie, will you do me a favor? With much pleasure. Doe has promised me a whole box of French bonbons, and if you will answer three questions, you shall have it. Allens, said Sophie, smiling. Haven't you a secret? asked Dee gravely. Yes. Will you tell us? No. Dee paused before she asked her last question, and Fan and Dora waited breathlessly while Sophie knit her brows and looked uneasy. Why not? Because I do not wish to tell it. Will you tell if we guess? Try. You are engaged. At this absurd suggestion, Sophie laughed gaily and shook her curly head. Do you think we are betrothed at sixteen in my country? I know that is an engagement ring. You made such a time about it when you lost it in the water and cried for joy when Tilly dived and found it. Ah, yes, I was truly glad. Dear Tilly, never do I forget that kindness. And Sophie kissed the little pearl ring in her impulsive way while her eyes sparkled and the frown vanished. I know a sweetheart gave it, insisted Dee. Sure now she had found a clue to the secret. He did. And Sophie hung her head in a sentimental way that made the three girls crowd nearer with faces full of interest. 
do tell us all about it, dear. It's so interesting to hear love stories. What is his name? cried Dora. Hermann, simpered Sophie, drooping still more, while her lips trembled with suppressed emotion of some sort. How lovely, sighed Fanny, who was very romantic. Tell on, do. Is he handsome? To me, the finest man in all the world, confessed Sophie as she hid her face. And you love him? I adore him. And Sophie clasped her hands so dramatically that the girls were a little startled, yet charmed at this discovery. Have you his picture? asked Dee, feeling that she had won her wager now. Yes, and pulling out the locket again, Sophie showed in the other side the face of a fine old gentleman who looked very like herself. It's your father, exclaimed Fanny, rolling her blue eyes excitedly. You are a humbug, cried Dora. Then you fibbed about the ring, said Dee crossly. Never. It is Mama's betrothal ring, but her finger grew too plump. And when I left home, she gave the ring to me as a charm to keep me safe. Ah, uh ha. -huh. I have my little joke as well as you, and the laugh is for me this time. And falling back among the sofa cushions, Sophie enjoyed it as only a gay girl could. Doe and Fanny joined her, but Dee was much disgusted and vowed she would discover the secret and keep all the bonbons to herself. You are most welcome, but I will not tell until I like, and then to Fanny first. She will not have ridicule for what I do, but say it is well, and be glad with me. Come now and work. I will plait these ribbons, or paint a wild rose on this pretty fan. It is too plain now. Will you that I do it, dear Dee? The kind tone and the prospect of such an ornament to her gift appeased Dee somewhat. But the mirthful malice in Sophie's eyes made the other more than ever determined to be even with her by and by. Christmas Eve came and found Dee still in the dark which fact nettled her sadly, for Sophie tormented her and amused the other girls by pretended confidences and dark hints at the mystery which might never, never be disclosed. Fan had determined to have an unusually jolly party, so she invited only her chosen friends and opened the festivities with a Christmas tree as the prettiest way of exchanging gifts and providing jokes for the evening in the shape of delusive bottles, animals full of candy, and every sort of musical instrument to be used in an impromptu concert afterward. The presents to one another were done up in secure parcels, so that they might burst upon the public eye in all their freshness. Dee was very curious to know what Fan was going to give her, for Fanny was a generous creature and loved to give. Dee was a little jealous of her love for Sophie and couldn't rest till she discovered which was to get the finer gift. So she went early and slipped into the room where the tree stood to peep and pick a bit, as well as to hang up a few trifles of her own. She guessed several things by feeling the parcels, but one excited her curiosity intensely. 
and she could not resist turning it about and pulling up one corner of the lid. It was a flat box, prettily ornamented with seaweeds like red lace and tied with scarlet ribbons. A tantalizing glimpse of jeweler's cotton, gold clasps, and something rose-colored conquered Dee's last scruples. And she was just about to untie the ribbons when she heard Fanny's voice and had only time to replace the box, pick up a paper that had fallen out of it, and fly up the back stairs to the dressing room, where she found Sophie and Dora surveying each other, as girls always do before they go down. You look like a daisy, cried Dee, admiring Dora with great interest, because she felt ashamed of her prying and the stolen note in her pocket. And you like a dandelion, returned Dew, falling back a step to get a good view of Dee's gold-colored dress and black velvet bows. Sophie is a lily of the valley, all in green and white, added Fanny, coming in with her own blue skirts, waving in the breeze. It does me very well. Little girls do not need grand toilets, and I am fine enough for a peasant, laughed Sophie, as she settled the fresh ribbons on her simple white cashmere and the holly wreath in her brown hair, but secretly longing for the fine dress she might have had. Why didn't you wear your silver necklace? It would be lovely on your pretty neck, said Dee, longing to know if she had given the trinket away. But Sophie was not to be caught, and said, with a contented smile, I do not care for ornaments unless someone I love gives me them. I had red roses for my bouquet de corsage, but the poor Madame Page was so triste. I left them on her table to remember her of me. It seemed so heartless to go and dance while she had only pain, but she wished it. Dear little Sophie, how good you are. And warm-hearted Fan kissed the blooming face that needed no roses to make it sweet and gay. Half an hour later, twenty girls and boys were dancing round the brilliant tree. Then its boughs were stripped. Everyone seemed contented. Even Sophie's little gifts gave pleasure, because with each went a merry or affectionate verse, which made great fun on being read aloud. She was quite loaded with pretty things, and had no words to express her gratitude and pleasure. Ah, you are all so good to me, and I have nothing beautiful for you. I receive much and give little, but I cannot help it. Wait a little, and I will redeem myself, she said to Fanny, with eyes full of tears and a lap heaped with gay and useful things. Never mind that now but look at this, for here's still another offering of friendship, and a very charming one, to judge by the outside, answered Fan, bringing the white box with the seaweed ornaments. Sophie opened it, and cries of admiration followed, for lying on the soft cotton was a lovely set of coral rosy pink branches, highly polished and fastened with gold clasps, formed necklace, bracelets, and a spray for the bosom. No note or card appeared, and the girls crowded round to admire and wonder who could have sent so valuable a gift. Can't you guess, Sophie, cried Dora, 
longing to own the pretty things. I should believe I knew, but it is too costly. How came the parcel fan? I think you must know all. And Sophie turned the box about, searching vainly for a name. An expressman left it, and Jane took off the wet paper and put it on my table with the other things. Here's the wrapper. Do you know that writing? And Fan offered the brown paper, which she had kept. No, and the label is all mud so I cannot see the place. Ah, well, I shall discover some day, but I should like to thank this generous friend at once. See now how fine I am. I do myself the honor to wear them at once. Smiling with girlish delight at her pretty ornaments, Sophie clasped the bracelets on her round arms, the necklace about her white throat, and set the rosy spray in the lace on her bosom. Then she took a little dance down the room and found herself before Dee, who was looking at her with an expression of naughty satisfaction on her face. Don't you wish you knew who sent them? Indeed, yes. And Sophie paused abruptly. Well, I know, and I won't tell till I like. It's my turn to have a secret, and I mean to keep it. But it is not right, began Sophie with indignation. Tell me yours, and I'll tell mine, said Dee teasingly. I will not. You have no right to touch my gifts, and I am sure you have done it. Else how know you who sends this fine cadeau, cried Sophie with the flash Dee liked to see. Here, Fanny interposed. If you have any note or card belonging to Sophie, give it up at once. She shall not be tormented. Out with it, Dee. I see your hand in your pocket, and I'm sure you have been in mischief. Take your old letter, then. I know what's in it. And if I can't keep my secret for fun, Sophie shall not have hers. That Tilly sent the coral, and Sophie spent her hundred dollars in books and clothes for that queer girl, who'd better stay among her lobsters than try to be a lady, cried Dee, bent on telling all she knew, while Sophie was reading her letter eagerly. Is it true? asked Dora, for the four girls were in a corner together, and the rest of the company busy pulling crackers. Just like her. I thought it was that, but she wouldn't tell. Tell us now, Sophie, for I think it was truly sweet and beautiful to help that poor girl. And let us say hard things of you, cried Fanny as her friend looked up with a face and a heart too full of happiness to help overflowing into words. Yes, I will tell you now. It was foolish, perhaps, but I did not want to be praised, and I loved to help that good Tilly. You know, she worked all summer and made a little sum. So glad, so proud she was and planned to study that she might go to school this winter. Well, in October, the uncle fell very ill, and Tilly gave all her money for the doctors. The uncle had been kind to her. She did not forget she was glad to help, and told no one but me. Then I said, What better can I do with my father's gift than give it to the dear creature? and let her lose no time. I do it, she will not at first, but I write and say, it must be, and she submits. She is made neat with some little dresses, and she goes at last to be so happy 
and do so well that I am proud of her. Is not that better than fine toilets and rich gifts to those who need nothing? Truly, yes. Yet I confess it cost me pain to give up my plans for Christmas and to seem selfish or ungrateful. Forgive me that. Yes, indeed, you dear generous thing, cried Fan and Dora, touched by the truth. But how came Tilly to send you such a splendid present? asked Dee. Shouldn't think you'd like her to spend your money in such things. She did not. A sea captain, a friend of the uncle, gave her these lovely ornaments, and she sends them to me with a letter that is more precious than all the coral in the sea. I cannot read it, but of all my gifts, this is the dearest and the best. Sophie had spoken eagerly, and her face, her voice, her gestures made the little story eloquent. But with the last words, she clasped the letter to her bosom, as if it well repaid her for all the sacrifices she had made. They might seem small to others, but she was sensitive and proud, anxious to be loved in the strange country, and fond of giving, so it cost her many tears to seem mean and thoughtless, to go poorly dressed, and be thought hardly of by those she wished to please. She did not like to tell of her own generosity, because it seemed like boasting, and she was not sure that it had been wise to give so much. Therefore, she waited to see if Tilly was worthy of the trust reposed in her, and she now found a balm for many wounds in the loving letter that came with the beautiful and unexpected gift. Dee listened with hot cheeks, and when Sophie paused, she whispered regretfully, Forgive me, I was wrong. I'll keep your gift all my life to remember you by, for you are the best and dearest girl I know. Then, with a hasty kiss, she ran away, carrying with great care the white shell on which Sophie had painted a dainty little picture of the mermaids, waiting for the pretty boat that brought good fortune to poor Tilly. And this lesson to those who were hereafter her faithful friends. The End This concludes this reading of Christmas Stories by Louisa May Alcott. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. To request our next book or shop our store, visit aireadtome.com. Thanks for listening.